So I'm going to share. You need to cancel your sharing just, just oh, really okay. quickly. I'll tell you what, I can do that for you. Yeah. Um, there we go. So everyone, hopefully you can see my, um, my screen. And uh, so we've got these, uh, these nine talks. That's the schedule of the day. The only change is that Larry had to drop out. And so hope you've been, you've been changed to 1120. We'll, we'll, we'll have a lunch break from 1140 to one o'clock. Um, I just want to let everybody know that um, we can't hear you. Everyone's automatically muted. And um, the way we'll do this for, for questions is that you should be able to go to the chat window and just type in your question. And then I'll be looking for those questions and I'll read them out. Um, I think that's probably a, a better way uh, to organize this. Um, rather than having people uh, raise their hands and ask questions um, because I have to get it, give everybody permission to do that. So it's easier for me just to read your question. Maybe um, I see, um, you know, Rick Carlson, you're on there. Rick, can you just uh, type in a question real quick or type in something to make sure that this is working? I've also unmuted you, Rick, so you can uh, let me know if you hear this. Yeah, I hear it. I, I'm trying to type something in the chat window, and it's not uh, typing. Uh, I don't know why. It's, it looks like it should. OK, Alan, I see one from you. I can see George. <laughs> Mine just keeps making weird noises at me and not typing anything in the chat window. <laughs> why don't Why don't you do this? Uh, I, I can kind of do both things. So everyone will have the option to either, I prefer that you write a question into the chat window, but you can also raise your hand if that's not working. And um, I'll try to pay attention to that. Oh, okay, Rick, I see you figured it out. Got it. Yeah. So again, for everybody that's here, we've got 27 attendees now. Um, when, when, when you wanna write in a question, do so into the chat window and then I'll ask that question. Um, you know, that also works well because during the talk, if you, if you think of a question, just go ahead and write it right in um, and, I'll, and I'll pay attention to that. Okay, so I need to stop sharing. And the first talk of the day is gonna be by Asma. And Asma, I'm going to let you um, share now. Okay. And um, you so, can you mm -hmm. can take you can take it away. Okay. Hi everyone. So um, I'm going to um, show you some results about the assessment of the classification of pre-solder silicon carbide grains using cluster analysis. So pre-solar grains are minerals mostly found in chondrites and interplanetary dust particles. For example, in the picture on the right, you can see how uh, actually with the nano seams, it's easy to find pre-solar grains because their isotopic composition is very different than the rest of the meteorite. Um, uh, actually, this grain, those grains form in, uh, uh, before our solar system in earlier stars. And the isotopic compositions are key to understand nucleosynthesis, stellar evolution, and the galactic chemical evolution. The classification of pre solar grains was previously done by hand with poor statistics. For example, in this um, diagram here, you see nitrogen and carbon isotopic compositions with different types of grains previously defined, with grains presumably formed in AGB stars, supernova, nova and J carbon or AGB born against stars. And uh, here we conducted cluster analysis of SIC pre solar grains using unsupervised machine learning algorithms to improve this classification. We used the online database on pre solar grains currently being updated and you can find the last uh, database um, in the LPSC abstract of uh, 
LPC abstract for this meeting here, was supposed to be used soon. Um, and so the cluster analysis technique we use is, the, is a model-based clustering. So it's a, based on the, the priority model considering a mixture of multivariate distribution. So actually the model considers that each cluster is a mixture of Gaussians. For example, in 1G here, you have a mixture of Gaussians and in 2G, uh, you also have this um, different clusters, with different combinations of Gaussians. So the model calculates the probability that each data point belongs to each cluster. And this technique is very powerful because it is possible to resolve overlapping data and take into account of the whole structure of the data set. So uh, before running the cluster analysis, we had to do some data cleaning and normalization. So for example, um, in this nitrogen carbon silicon isotopes for all uh, previous, previously defined type grain, grain types, you can see that C grains and U grains have scars, are actually scars and uh, heterogeneous in composition. And so we excluded them to reduce the skewness of the data. Um, and for example, here you can see the spread, the, this plot is called violin plot and you can see the spread of the data. So here shown for carbon, nitrogen and silicon isotopes. And uh, you can see so skewness means uh, whenever you have a spread of the data with very few data points having um, uh, very, very, very different isotopic compositions. And so um, we had to exclude those grains to reduce the skewness of the data. And also we converted all of the, the isotopic compositions that were previously expressed in delta form into ratios to homogenize these variations. And we also converted all isotopic ratios into log units and then normalized to the same average and standard deviation. So this is what we get here. The same plot after all of these calculations, we have a better spread of the data. So it's more, um, it's better for running cluster analysis. And so um, what we use is a data set that you know, contains carbon, nitrogen, and silicon isotopes. In total, we have um, 1,500 data points on this data set. And these are our results here. We have 13 clusters uh, shown with different colors. And if we zoom in here in this region where we have those mainstream grains, we can see something that's interesting here. We have a cluster, the cluster number two in dark green, that has a terrestrial nitrogen isotopic composition and solar carbon and silicon isotopic compositions. So this cluster, the grains contained in these clusters are interpreted as being contaminated grains. So with cluster analysis, we could identify a cluster made of contaminated grains. And we can also compare our result of cluster analysis with the original classification here. So I uh, use the same color so it's easy to compare one with another. Um, um, we can look at for each cluster what kind of grain, grain type are included in each cluster. And what we found is that we have, um, well, the cluster number two here made of content where we um, interpret as contaminated grains. And also X grains form three different clusters now. So we have three different um, clusters for only X grains. AB form four clusters here. M distributed in five different clusters. Z grains with nine clusters, um, uh, all, almost all included in this one cluster number nine. Y distributed in three different clusters, and finally N formed two different clusters. So here clearly we have a higher number of clusters than the original um, classification with uh, more than the double number of uh, groups of grains, 13 versus five or six in the previous classification. And also something that's very interesting is for, exa uh, for example, Y grains here were defined as having a carbon isotopic composition that's higher than the solder value, and we don't find any grain cluster, or cluster of grains that has a specific composition. So it might be possible that this solder value was just an arbitrary definition because it is easy to see without with with eyes, and uh, with cluster analysis, we're able to have to, to see uh, divisions between groups of groups that are 
with data sets that are overlapping. So we can look at the probability that each data point belongs to its assigned cluster. And it's shown in um, transparency here, where as you can see, there's not a lot of transparency, just a few points here and there. And that's because uh, actually our cluster analysis is, um, is um, accurate. We have a probability mostly included between 0.8 and 1. So we can look at the quality of this clustering for each cluster. Um, shown here the average priority versus cluster. And so the contaminated grain has a priority close to one. And some other grains have an average priority that's higher than 0.9, shown here in these arrows. And um, one cluster here, the cluster number eight, that has a relatively low average probability. So we can also look at the year of publication for all grains here in each cluster, shown in this diagram here. So this uh, in y-axis, you have the maximum year of publication. It's a cumulative diagram. So uh, for 2005 here, um, at 2005 here, you have all of the data that were published before 2005, for example. And so, uh, as you can see here, the cluster number 13 here shown in blue contain grains that were, uh, which data were recently published in the last four years, while the cluster number 12 here in pink contain grains which data were published in the last 10 years. So this shows that these clusters are actually um, with data that were recently published and this may uh, suggest that the data set may not be complete. And that's good to have in mind is that the results we show now are for the data that we have now. And in the future, we um, analyzing more, grain, more grains um, may lead to new clusters. So it's important to uh, analyze more uh, precursor grains to have a better, more accurate classification of precursor grains. So I run cluster analysis for data sets uh, with different year of publications. And so for example, considering only the data published before 2095, only data published before 2000, 2005, 2006, and so on. Um, and so here I show the number of clusters that we found with this clustering. And uh, we can see that the number of clusters varies um, from five to 16, but this variation is larger for the first one, the data sets were, were very small, uh, small in the first years of publication. And once uh, we reach, uh, when the data is uh, younger, we use data younger than 2007, we have a number of clusters that's between eight and 13. So for example, sorry, this is, for example, these are results with the last four data sets from the um, um, published before the last four, four, four years here, you can see that we don't have that different uh, results. We actually have clusters that are um, like, and uh, we can look at the average probability of each cluster over average over years of publication uh, to compare the different results for different subsets of the data. Um, in this plot, and so this is called a box plot. It's very practical because you can see the spread of the data uh, on top of the median value and uh, taking also into account of uh, excluding outliers as well. And so when, com look at the, uh, when looking at those um, average probabilities for each cluster here, uh, something interesting is that all of the clusters that contain A, B, N, and X grains have a higher average probability than those containing M, Y, and Z grains. So um, in detail here, clusters containing A, B, N, and X are this blue, uh, green, purple, uh, light blue, orange, and brown here. They have a probability that's higher than 0.9. Um, unlike the, these uh, grains in the mainstream way, Y and Z grains that have average probability that's lower and so um, it looks like these clusters that define M, A, B, N, and X grains may be more accurate than clusters containing M, Y, and Z grains. So that's something that's good in, to keep in mind in the future that to, we need to have a better, better um, class, uh, clustering of 
these grains of M, Y, and Z grains maybe by using more other isotopic compositions. We can also compare our results with previous subdivisions that were recently proposed in the literature. For example, for X grains, uh, it was proposed that we have um, X grains might define three different subgroups, X0, X1, and X2 with different enrichment in silicon, um, as a silicon 28 isotopic compositions. And so, um, for example, here we found that we have a cluster that's close to the X1 isotopic composition with a very nicely defined slope, but two, the two other clusters do not actually coincide much with the X0 and X2 um, uh, previously subgroups of grains. We can also look at new definitions of subgroups of AB grains. So another study suggested that AB might be in divided into AB1 and AB2. However, our results here, we see four different clusters for these AB grains and their um, isotopic compositions are actually overlapping. So again, with cluster analysis, it is possible to have, to, to find clusters, some groups of grains that have overlapping compositions um, uh, while uh, with our human eyes, I mean, we have we, we have to stick with boundaries that we can see, for example, here, AB1 and AB2 were proposed to have uh, higher than the, or lower so, uh, uh, isotopic composition than the solder value. So here it's really nice to see that we can actually find some more uh, better definition of groups of grains. And we can compare this AB grains composition with um, those uh, with models of NOVA and supernova, for example, in this diagram here, shown in blue and red, on all of those clusters that we have for AB grains uh, that have a higher um, excesses in 15 nitrogen, overlap with models of supernova, supernova. And so it looks like um, the AB grains and N grains here have. Um, has supernova origin. And we don't have any cluster that or overlaps nicely with the field of nova models. So it is possible that we're not able yet with, the, with our sampling of pre-solar grains to sample uh, nova grains coming from nova. So to conclude here, uh, with cluster analysis, we found a larger number of clusters than the grain types defined in the literature five containing M grains, four for AB, and three and for X grains. And we also identified a cluster of contaminated grains with a terrestrial isotopic composition. And cluster analysis can group grains with overlapping isotopic compositions, which helps avoiding the use of arbitrary definitions like solder compositions or as, as boundaries for grain types. So we can, um, we can surpass, we can find some clusters um, with the better statistics without using um, boundaries for arbitrary definitions like uh, solder values. And also clusters forming N and AB grains with the nitrogen, 15 nitrogen excesses suggest a supernova origin. And finally, more data on other isotopic compositions can help improve in cluster analysis of pre-solder grains, especially for uh, grains um, from uh, mainstream Y and Z grains. Thank you. Thank you, Asma. Um, I see we have about 46 attendees now, and I think not everyone has heard the instructions. So you're yeah. all automatically muted, and, and um, we can't see you. And the way we're going to do questions is you should be able to go to a chat window. Everyone at the bottom of your screen should see an option for chat. And you can, you can uh, type in a question there, and then I'll read that question out. There's simply too many of you to allow everyone to just break in um, with, with, with audio. If you're, a, if you're a speaker, as it's your turn, I will be giving you panelist privileges, and at that point, we'll be able to see and hear you, and you'll be able to share your screen with us. Uh, so again, thanks so much, Ozma, for that talk. And does anyone have a question, please, uh, please type it in. Until, until I see a question, I'll start with a question, Ozma. Okay. And so on many of these uh, basically XY kind of plots, we see 
a lot of yeah. overlap. You would never you would never pick those clusters out. Obviously, that's kind of the point of cluster analysis. But for any particular um, cluster, how yeah. how do you distinguish what variable in the multi dimensional space is distinguishing that cluster? Oh yeah, uh, so we can do that with um, random forests. So it's something that I will do next. Uh, you can have uh, some um, ranking of each attribute that defines better a uh, cluster. So yeah, yeah. so um, so actually for each cluster here, you have a variation of you have average composition and the variation of this composition here, standard deviation, maximum, minimum value. And so that gives you what a cluster, how the cluster is defined. And, um, but then, you know, uh, for example, this cluster here is more defined, uh, is, um, is, is more defined with the different car carbon isotopic composition. So the question is, how do we define each cluster? Um, what parameter defines better cluster? Hmm. Um, there is, I, so I was saying there's the black, black forest, um, um, algorithm that can gives you what parameters def um, is more important for the whole clustering of all clusters, not only one. Right. Yeah. And uh, so for so. Um, well, okay. But that's not good. for I've each got, cluster. Two, yeah. So oh, sorry, I've so. got two questions coming in now, and I, I'm okay. on cognizant of mm -hmm. time. So George Cody asks, why do the distributions have to be Gaussian? This appears to be the critical constraint. Yeah, well, because you know, we need a model to have to have this clustering, you need a model. And so you can, there is another, there are many algorithms, for example, there's a k-means where you calculated the distance between all points from the center of the cluster, but that doesn't give you uh, uh, some good uh, analysis for overlapping data. And um, this M cluster is based on uh, Gaussian, but it's the the the, the better the, the best model for best clustering for a complex data set where data is overlapping each other. And so, um, it's, it's, so that's how you, that's how you have to do. For example, when you do regress, re, linear regression, you consider it's a line, but it can be not a line but a curve, and so you can be poly polynomial or exponential. So it's, we have to stick with some math, and so uh, the math here is a Gaussian model, um, uh, and that's the best we can do. And right now, data scientists are actually finding some other techniques for clustering that take into account different shapes. Um, yeah, so. Okay, good, thanks. I've got two more questions I'd like to get to. One is from Steve Shirey. Mm -hmm. um, did the sample preparation vary with time over the years? And if so, how did the clusters vary with the sample dissolution technique? That sounds like a tricky question. Um, no, yeah, it's a very good question. We, uh, we are, uh, yeah, we, you know, we, we are actually in the future, we're gonna take into account of the, uh, the tight uh, the, um, technique for analyzing grains. So we can do that. We just need to have one uh, one column that that um, when, uh, gives the uh, add on top, just like having another attribute instead of isotopic composition, the technique used there, and we may find something more interesting there. Yeah. Right. That's that's interesting. Okay. One final question from Alicia Weinberger, and, and Alicia asks, "What kind of priors do you need to put on the algorithm? For example, minimum, maximum width, um, oh. and how does it keep adding clusters?" And how do you decide when it's enough? Uh, so, um, so the the so the shape of clusters is defined is defined by the model, and so in cluster analysis, uh, in this kind of cluster analysis, n cluster, um, it does doesn't make any assumption on the on the the shape of those clusters. So it's just mixtures of Gaussians, whatever the shape is. Um, and uh, the, and so it's, it's only based on the priority, how much, uh, how uh, to have a higher priority for each uh, data point in clusters. And the other question is um, the number of clusters is also uh, not something that, we're, not an assumption, it's the result. So the, the final number of clusters is the best model with the higher, highest probability for all uh, data points. 
So okay. yeah. great. Thank you so much, Osma. That's super. No problem. Um, if you could quit sharing, then I will give yeah. George uh, his Thank address. You. Thanks, Mike. Okay, George, you should be a you should be able to share with us now. Make sure you unmute. There you go. All right. <clears throat> Let's see. Can you see that? I can see it. Very good. Okay. Let me start my timer so that I stick to time. Uh, all right. So um, title of this uh, talk is Formation and Molecular Evolution of Organic Solids Under Hydrothermal Conditions in Planetesimal Interiors. My co-author is our Dean Isis Vestuskus and uh, high school uh, summer intern was Eli Harrison. Uh, this is supported, we're grateful for support from NASA's Emerging Worlds program. Um, I'm just getting beeps and not being able to advance. Mm. Let's see. Ah. There you go, yeah. Okay, don't know what I was doing. Um, so the crux is if we assume that insoluble organic matter characters of carbonaceous material, uh, chondrites and comets formed in the interiors during radiogenic heating, does this reaction have consequences? And what I mean by that is, well, we, we think that they do occur in planetary, planetesimal uh, interiors. We do experiments to test this. And we note that, um, that these reactions generate a lot of gas pressure. So for example, at 180 degrees centigrade with isothermal heating for 24 hours, you get about 30% mass yield of solids. And with the elemental analysis, we can determine the hydrogen and oxygen content of those solids and make a balanced reaction where it's possible that we can generate 1.2 moles of gas from one mole of starting material. And, and that's a lot of gas pressure. So if all the non, uh, we'll call it IOM products are gas, and the chemistry suggests that that would be likely, the press pressure generation could be very disruptive. And so we had thought about whether or not it would be uh, pressure generation be uh, sufficient to actually frack uh, small planetesimals, meaning can the fluid pressure exceed the lithostatic pressure plus the tensile strength of, of the, the object? And presumably small planetesimal has a pretty low tensile strength, but um, we used uh, just for estimates, uh, tensile strengths of sandstones, for example, which are probably higher. And so here on the right, uh, you see this plot. It's um, just a simulation where we assumed you know, the volume of, of the silica component was 0.6. We assumed a density of olivine. Um, volume of fluid is 0.2 and the pore volume is 0.2, which is, uh, seems reasonable. This is based on previous studies by Wilson et al. And um, for this particular 50 kilometer radius uh, object, um, it, it, it seems pretty clear that at some levels, uh, the fluid, it, dep it depends on what the, the fluid volume you know, if it gets compacted, the, the pore volume decreases, and of course, then the overpressuring will increase. And so depending on those various scenarios, you could disrupt a significant uh, portion of, of the planetesimal. Um, the question is, of course, it's not just how much gas you generate, but how quickly, you ge how fast you generate it. You know, the, the faster you generate, the more disruptive the, uh, the sy system will be. So we knew we needed to get good thermokinetic data to see how this would be the case, and, and the idea is to input this then into a planetesimal thermal model um, to, to see whether or not how overpressuring might develop. So um, there are a number of different ways of doing this. Previously, uh, my postdoc, Yoko Kepabakawa, was working on these reactions, and she used mass growth, and, and she got some decent kinetics, and so at least from the standpoint of, of looking at the kinetics of mass growth, um, that's one way to do it. Um, the problem is, is that you're, you're convolving mass growth with mass loss and without being able to actually see what the mass loss is due to gas generation. And so we decided this uh, pre previous summer that we would really try to get a more molecular um, picture of, of the reaction. So I'll call this the SYN-IOM reaction, synthetic IOM reaction. And previously when I proposed this chemistry, I identified a minimum of seven discrete steps that would be required to go from a sugar precursor to ultimately an IOM-like uh, macromolecule. So we predicted that the, the kinetics was gonna be extraordinarily complicated. And so therefore we, we said, we'll do C13 solid state NMR. It, it turns out 
fascinatingly that um, this reaction is uh, appears to be extremely highly concerted, meaning that you cannot disentangle any of the stepwise reaction pathways. It's it's almost like sugar goes to sin ion in one shot. And so you can see this in the stack plot of C13 solid state MR spectra. You can see whereas alcohol is going down in intensity as time increases from eight hours to 44 hours at 160 degrees centigrade. You can see the sin IM grows and it grows essentially equally in intensity in all regions of the spectrum. So a concerted reaction certainly will simplify the kinetic modeling, but it, it definitely complicates the determination of reaction details um, for the mechanism because you, you really can't sort out specifically what's what's going where and, and, and what's what a product of what. So to exemplify, it uh, turns out that this, in addition to being complex in, in a mechanistic sense, it's also a very complex kinetic behavior. There's a, the summer we identify there's three different kinetic domains. Uh, in the beginning, the reaction solutions just change color. They get redder and redder and redder. If you saw my talk yesterday, that's relevant to that. Um, and eventually uh, they go into a stage of, of this uh, it's a turbid solution. It's absolutely opaque. Um, there are no precipitated solids. Um, and it stays in this state for some period of time. And you can, at that point, we can separate solids from that by doing centrifugation and we acidify the solutions and we can precipitate this stuff out. So we do that. So we, at that point, we get a turbid solution. We can collect solids. Up to that point, we couldn't. Um, and you can see that in this state, uh, let me turn that off. Sorry. Um, in that state, uh, right, <laughs> sorry. Uh, in, in that state, the alcohol loss goes at a certain rate, and all of a sudden, it just it is a precipitous drop um, right into, um, into the precipitation of the black solids themselves. And uh, the phone call just came at the absolute worst time because now it's knocked me off my timer. There we go. Um, okay, so, so then you get a state where all of a sudden you have this black solids and, and, and you have a color solution and over time the color solution gets clearer and clearer. So these are extremely complicated kinetics actually. And um, we realize that, that trying to get good Arrhenius parameters out of this is gonna be um, difficult. Um, so to highlight this in a little bit more detail, here I'm comparing 160 isothermal, 180 isothermal, 200 isothermal, and what you see is eventually you, you get to a point where things plateau and where things plateau, this is where you start to precipitate these black solids, the sen, sen IOM analog material. So you form about the same amount of aromatic carbon, whether it's 160 or 180 or 200, but there's some devils in the details. If you look at the, the other two, so the red balls are, are carbonyl and the black squares are aliphatic. And you can see that systematically there's a big difference in the aliphatic to carbonyl ratio. And getting back to the mechanism, I, I really cannot give you a, a clear explanation as to why there would be any relationship between those two functional groups in, in a reaction sense. So um, we did look at mass growth as Yoko Kebokawa did, and, and that shows reasonable Arrhenius behavior. So you can see on the left, you know, slopes, um, essentially linear slopes of yield of mass as a function of time for um, different temperatures and you can extract rates for those slopes and then you can plot the rates as a function of one over t and you get a nice linear relationship and, and reasonable um, activation energy and, and exponential prefactor. So these are, um, you know, they're, they're, it's kind of like carriage and maturation in terms of activation energies. Um, but as I said, the problem is for the standpoint of understanding gas generation, mass doesn't really help us. So we really need to focus on the molecular. Um, now, getting back to what I showed you earlier, the, the other thing that's peculiar is the final products at say long times at any given temperature are slightly but significantly different. And what we believe is happening is that for any given isothermal experiment at a given temperature, you end up with a final state that's some, some sort of metastable state that's defined by the temperature. And this becomes a real problem then if you want to use isothermal kinetics to extract uh, activation energies, because obviously you're just, you're gonna be comparing every, every temperature you use is gonna define a, a different final uh, metastable state. And so 
you know, after struggling to get this far and really being surprised at how complicated the system should be, I don't know why we should have been so surprised. Um, we realized that, that probably this coming summer, if we ever get back in the lab again, we're going to have to start taking a, a different approach, which would be fixed heating rate experiments and using more of a Monte Carlo approach to try to extract a distributed uh, activation energy model, which is how people typically do this in formation of, say, for example, oil generation from carogens or gas generation from carogens, um, because they also have the similar problem with, with metastability. Um, so in any case, this is going to complicate things. Um, and so we also had the opportunity working with the Anesis to get elemental data on this, and that's, that's what we did. And um, this highlights exactly the same problem I'm just describing, this idea of metastable uh, states. So before you can do before you do anything to make this thin ion, the first reaction is just a simple dehydration of, of hydroxyl groups off of the sugar. And so you can write that reaction as I've written it on top. Um, so one mole CH2O will give you one mole of a dehydrated product and 0.33 moles of, of water. Um, and then I've highlighted on this H to C and O to C on the left axis and time on the, on the X axis. The, the dashed red line is, is what the hydrogen to carbon ratio would be with the, just the dehydration reaction. And then blue line is what the O to C would be with just dehydration. And then the actual um, syn IOM. And you can see that clearly, to, you know, these, these are the first solids. You know, we collect the solids the second we can collect them, the second they exist. So they just basically precipitate out at, at the values they have. And you'll notice that the 160, for example, in H to C is offset with more hydrogen than the 180. And, and both curves evolve with time, um, not, not in a spectacular way, but they evolve in time. But in no way do they look like they're converging. So this is just another evidence of, of the fact that we're stuck in some sort of metastable state. And uh, isothermal kinetics is just not going to give us what we need to to know if we want to input this in the planetary thermal model. Um, we were interested whether this metastable states are, you can kick yourself out of them. So here we took uh, 250 degree seven hour solids and then we heated them for another seven hours at 250 and you could see continued change. So black is, is the, the, you know, hit it twice and red is what we started with and on the right is a different spectrum and you can see that you're, you're losing functional groups you'd like to lose and you're gaining functional groups that you like to get to make it look more like Murchison, for example. And similarly, if we took 160 degree solids and then we whack it at 250, um, we're, we get out of that stuck state. So, so temperature in some ways is, is you know, it's, it's, it's not just a fixed variable, it's, it's a critical variable in trying to understand the molecular evolution. Um, so, the last bit is somewhat interesting. So we recognized last year, as we put this together, the SYN IOM is a good model for actual IOM that you've seen in carbonaceous chondrate, or for that matter, refractory organic carbon that you see in comets, principally in IDPs. Um, but it's not perfect. So it's, it's very good with regards to the fraction of aromatic carbon. So I'm comparing Tagish Lake class 5B, which is, we think, a very primitive um, type of IOM, kind of like a CR-like IOM, with the syn IOM um, from glucose, and, and basically the aromaticities are the same. Um, but you can see when you look at the overlapping spectra that, for example, at the higher frequency to the far, you know, left side of the spectrum, you'll see that we have much more intensity in the carbonyl region. Um, we still have too much intensity in the, the enol or furan region, which is this sort of sharp spike right off the main peak. And then we lack um, sufficient intensity in the alcohol region, which I highlight with the, um, a red uh, asterisk. And in fact, if you, you try to balance the, the reaction, you find it balances rather nicely through just a, a simple uh, reduction, just reacting hydrogen um, with, with syn IOM. Uh, could convert um, syn OIM into something that looked much more like Tagus Lake 5B, at least stoichiometrically. Um, I note that the amount of hydrogen you need to do this way exceeds hydrogen solubility in water. And so therefore, um, 
you would need in a natural system, a continuous flux of hydrogen saturated water to get any sort of reduction significant enough that it would start to look like this. And so this then also falls into the idea of being able to integrate this chemistry into a, a thermal model of, of, of a planetesimal um, to show that basically as these reactions occur, you're generating hydrogen you know, from the deep and that hydrogen is gonna flux out radially towards the surface and start to reduce other SIN-IM reactions that start to proceed once the temperature gets high enough. Um, but we were intrigued whether actually you could reduce this stuff at all. I mean, this is a speculation at this point. And so we set out to do this. Um, and since we couldn't set up a continuous flow reactor for hydrogen to get the, all the hydrogen we needed, we, we just cheated and we used a sodium borohydride, um, which is water soluble. And it's, it's a moderate reducing agent. It's not, um, it's not a really scary one, um, but it, it, it does the job. And it's well known for reducing aldehydes and ketones to alcohols. And so the question is, it's usually done in a solution. And so we're trying to do this with, with precipitated solids. And it wasn't clear that this reaction was a work, but it did. And you can see the spectra on the left, the carbonyls uh, and carboxylic group carbonyls, um, those two peaks drop about 50%. And... Um, I'm getting a thing that my internet is unstable. Um, mm -hmm. And you can see that, that we've, gener we've created alcohol and we lost some of the sharp aliphatic compounds. In fact, the reaction is, is quite surprising. It's because much more than just a reduction of carbonyl to alcohol occurs. And so this is promising. And when I ever get back in the laboratory again, uh, we're gonna explore this further. But it might have some interesting implications. And I'm George, getting- you're gonna need to wrap this up. Okay, um, I'm only at 15 minutes, but I will. <laughs> Um, so this is the last slide, by the way. So it may, it may explain why carbonaceous chondrates IOM is different than IDP. So in this particular slide, F50 and F250 are syn IOM, carbon zane spectra. And you can see these three or four characteristic peaks. On the right, you see carbon zane spectra of IDPs, right? And you look at the top and you see Murchison. You can see that Murchison differs in the sense of carbonyl contents two and three are not as intense, but these look like they're the same. So in conclusion, synion connects are very complicated. Classic isothermic reactions uh, are gonna be difficult. Um, it has much more carbonyl, it can be reduced. An IDP is similar to synion suggesting that carbon aqueous chondrite ion has experienced partial reduction and IDs have not. And the question is why, thank you. I get to do all the clapping. Um, thanks a lot, George. For all the panelists um, and attendees, uh, remember that if you want to ask a question, please type it in. Um, I'll ask when you started out talking about um, the potential for fracking of, of, of these small planetesimals and whether or not they would have the energy to, to possibly break up. And I'm, I'm wondering how you do a model like that with the formation of these gases. Is it, is, is, are they equally distributed throughout the body? Um, what is the volume change of the reaction? How do you go in, how do you develop a model for calculating the potential for breaking up a, an object like this? Yeah, so, so the potential, if, if you have a permeable pore network, then it gets quite complicated, right? Because if you're generating the gas, um, if the gas generation rates are low, you, you'll be able to dissipate that gas to the surface of the object without any disruption. You'll never generate significant overpressuring. Um, if you have an impermeable pore network, then it's just a question of what the pore volume is relative to the gas that's being generated. And in that simpler scenario, it's just as simple as PV equals NRT, right? So if you know how much material you have, you assume it's homogeneously distributed, which it seems to be in, in the matrix of carbonaceous chondrates. Um, then it's just a question of, of how much gas do you generate. And then the intermediate case is the one where you have a semi-permeable pore network. Then it becomes a question of how rapidly the gas generates. And, you know, I don't know if I want to put in enough effort in it to do this super hyper rigorously with, you know, fluid dynamics and things like that. I, I don't think given the constraints. So the kinetics are the simplest tell us, you know, how fast does gas generate over the evolution of, of the precipitation of the solids? And from there you can predict, you know, yes, it probably will be disruptive or no, it probably won't be disruptive. Right. We had another question along those lines. I think you've probably, from Steve, along those lines, which I think you've probably answered. If there are any more questions, please type them in quickly. Otherwise I'll take this opportunity to, um, relate a comment by Larry, who uh, um, is having trouble following sometimes, as we all did, with, with 
details of the slides. So if the, if the speakers, um, if you can use your cursor as a pointer. Yes, exactly. So, so from now on that, that could be helpful in some instances when you're, when you're talking about details on the slides. Uh, with that, thanks again so much, George, for that uh, excellent talk. And we're going to move on to Kay. So, George, if you could quit sharing, and I will give Kay permission. Kay, are you, do you have permission? There we go. You need to unmute now, okay? Can you hear me? Yes, brilliant. Thank so, you, take it away. Oh, uh, sorry, I was wondering if you could see this. Yep, not. we can see it. Uh, Okay, is this fine? Sorry. Yes, I can see it. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much for coming to this talk virtually. Uh, so I'll be talking about hydrogen abundances and isotopic composition in uh, chondral glasses of carbonaceous and ordinary chondrites. So I'd like to start with the big picture of uh, this talk, which is the origin of the solar system. Uh, water. And so the big picture question here is how do we get from this sort of picture to what we have today, where we have water, which is essential for life on Earth and other part uh, solar system materials. And the way that I like to get at this question is using chondrites. Chondrites are coming from the asteroid belt. And these are some examples of materials that we've been to uh, through the efforts of uh, NASA and JAXA. However, uh, so these uh, chondrites are remnants and also witnesses of the early solar system formation and containing somewhere between 0.1 and 12 weight percent water. Uh, they are important sources of water on Earth and other parts of the solar system. And we have samples of these materials on Earth. And they are composed of materials such as chondrules and refractory inclusions, which are these uh, beautiful looking material here. And the fine grain matrix, which are the opaque material in the dark, and also iron nickel metal. Now these chondrites didn't start off like this, but this is a schematic diagram of what um, the process they might have gone through, which is that Initially, they start off with chondrules as well as ice that are created into the uh, parent body. And through decay of 26 aluminum to 26 magnesium, this water ice melts to form materials such as phyllosilicates. So what I'm trying to show here is that these chondrites record what water was doing in the early solar system. And by looking at their composition, Today, we might be able to get at the, uh, what water was doing in the early solar system. So first of all, I'd like to start off looking at the water and the bulk material as an introduction before getting into the water and chondrules, which is the focus of the study. So this is the uh, isotopic composition of hydrogen plot on the y-axis of the different materials in our solar system. And the isotopic composition normalized to the Earth's ocean uh, isotopic composition. So as you can see, uh, the Sun, Jupiter, Uranus have a similar isotopic composition that is deuterium poor relative to Earth's ocean, as well as lunar appetites and Martian melt inclusions. Whereas the comets seem to have a more uh, deuterium-rich composition compared to earth, uh, materials such as Earth's water 
And when we look at the bulk composition of the carbonaceous chondrites, they're a fairly good match to Earth, Moon, as well as Mars. And the story that this tells us is that the idea of these carbonaceous chondrites that formed in the outer solar system where it's, it's cold enough for water to condense that then gets brought into where Earth as well as Mars formed. And this is a model of, from Walsh and others in 2011 showing the sort of dynamics of this process where Jupiter and Saturn migrates in. The red is the water poor material, whereas once Jupiter and Saturn migrates out, the blue material that's is water rich, such as the carbonaceous chondrites, brings in the water into Earth. So this is sort of the big picture idea that the bulk chondrites tell us. That sort of outstanding question that I'd like to talk about in this talk is what do the chondrules record? So coming back to the schematic diagram, chondrules compose somewhere about 30 to 80 uh, volume percent of chondrites, which is a pretty significant amount. There are igneous spherules of somewhere around 0.1 to 1 millimeter diameter, thought to have formed at a very, very high temperature. And they're composed of a material such as olivine, OPX, glass, iron, nickel, metal, and iron, nickel sulfides. Sorry, this is a, an actual picture of uh, an example of chondrite where these spherical materials are all chondrules. And this is an example of a uh, chondral that I studied. This light material is the glass. The darker material is olivine. These are iron nickel metal. And this is sort of one of the oldest solar system rocks formed after about one to four million years after solar system formation. So the reason why looking at the DH ratio in these materials is interesting is because we don't still don't understand how these materials formed. There are different ideas such as uh, sort of nebular scenarios where light uh, processes such as lightning, nebular shock and magnetic current sheets generate the heat that is required to produce this uh, sort of molten spherule. And this is an example of a simulation showing the, uh, the second scenario where nebular shock um, is able to generate a high enough temperature to uh, produce these, potentially produce materials similar to these chondrules. And the interesting part where DH comes in is that these types of scenarios, we would expect the D to H ratio in the chondrules to be nebular-like, similar to the sun. Another scenario for chondral formation is impact or collision of planetesimals, where planetesimals uh, collide with each other and the melt, that sort of molten droplets that form in this process can explain uh, the existence of chondrules. So in this scenario, it's very different from the first three scenarios. The bulk DH, uh, the, the DH ratio recorded in these chondrules might be more similar to bulk chondrite-like. So coming back to this diagram, from the first three processes, we may ex expect the uh, chondral DH ratio to be quite deuterium poor, whereas if chondro is formed by impact collisions of planetesimals, they may be more similar to uh, bulk chondrites, similar to what we have on Earth and Moon and Mars. So, but the problem is, although chondrules may record DH ratios from these processes during its formation, chondrules also go through this process of uh, water ice melting as well as aqueous alteration. So when we look at chondrules, we see nice sort of fresh looking chondrules such as these, but also we see some chondrules that are kind of attacked sort of here these uh, iron nickel metals show evidence of oxidation. Also, there's these little veins going through it, which are the result of these processes such as aqueous alteration. So 
D, the DH ratio in chondros might also be affected by this sort of process. So what we've done is for this study, we've looked at the least altered and metamorphosed samples, samples that are closest to the original uh, chondral. And we measure the water content in these chondrules using the nanosims at DTM. And this is a, based on a method that uh, Eric developed for looking at lunar glasses, trying to look at very, very low volatile contents and look at uh, their isotopic composition. And uh, our detection limit is somewhere about 2.5 to 6 ppm of water. This is an example of a chondral that we measured. This is 100 microns for scale. These sort of square pits are where we analyze uh, the chondral glass, this light material using the nanosims. They're somewhere around 20 by 20 micron in diameter. So here are our results. So this is the DH ratio applied on the y-axis against the water content in log scale. And what we can see immediately is that some of the chondrules reach extremely high deuterium enrichment, somewhere about uh, 10,000 per mil of in DH. So the Earth plots, Earth's ocean plots at zero. And so these are enrichments of somewhere about 10 times the deuterium DH ratio that we see on Earth. And this uh, high deuterium enrichment is specifically observed in uh, QUE 97008 and Semarcona, which are ordinary chondrites. The carbonaceous chondrite, which is a blue circle, um, do have some amount of uh, deuterium enrichment, but not as much as the ordinary chondrite chondrites. And to show where comets plot, this blue uh, region is where the comets plot. And so some of the chondrules that we looked at are significantly more enriched in deuterium, even compared to comets. And this is uh, the diagram that I showed initially. This is a D deuterium hydrogen ratio of different materials in the solar system. And the red are our results from the uh, chondral glasses. So these ordinary chondrite chondral glasses are extremely enriched, even compared to the comets. And the only type of material that has a similar DH ratio would be these molecular ices that formed at extremely low temperatures in the outer solar system. So the question is, how do we, um, how did these chondrules become so determined enriched? So one potential origin is a, the primary origin. Primary meaning this high DH ratio is inherited from water ice that formed in the molecular cloud far away from the sun at extremely low temperatures. However, this would require that the ordinary chondrites that, that's thought to have formed closer to sun compared to carbonaceous chondrites accrete more of this molecular cloud ice formed in the outer solar system. So this is sort of a, a diagram showing uh, the distance from the sun and different formation ages. And the key is that the ordinary chondrites are thought to have formed closer to the sun compared to carbonaceous chondrites. So if this determined rich water ice is coming from the outer solar system, it's somewhat non-intuitive that the ordinary chondrites are the ones that have this extremely deuterium rich chondrules compared to the carbonaceous chondrites. An alternative explanation is that this is a secondary signature. Secondary meaning that this is the DH ratio is not recording water ice uh, composition, but it's uh, determined rich due to a parent body process. So during parent body process, the iron, uh, iron metal in the parent body is oxidized by water, forming magnetite and hydrogen gas. 
so if this hydrogen gas that forms through this process is deuterium poor and this hydrogen gas ex escapes the system, the leftover water becomes very, very deuterium enriched. So this is showing the DH ratio and the residual water versus fraction of hydrogen remaining. So if we start from 100% water remaining and lose the water hydrogen through this oxidation process, the residual water can reach a pretty deuterium enriched uh, composition. So based on the, the fact that the primary origin seems somewhat uh, non-intuitive, this is another possibility for in generating extreme deuterium enrichments. But the question is, how do you gen uh, put this deuterium rich water into chondrules? So what we have done here is to calculate the diffusion distance of water at relevant temperatures and time through glass using uh, uh, models of diffusion. And this is showing the diffusion distance against time for different types of glass compositions. And what we can see is that at least after 1 million year, water can diffuse about 350 microns into glass, which is comparable to the chondral diameter observed in uh, our samples. So the idea here is that the high DH ratio in the gla chondral glasses may be due to diffusion of hydrogen and deuterium from high DH fluids. And this high DH fluid can be generated during oxidation of iron by water and loss of deuterium poor hydrogen. So the, this is just showing schematically that this high DH water can flow through the matrix and this high DH signature can be diffused into the glass. So in summary, we observe extremely deuterium enriched uh, signatures in some of the ordinary chondrite chondrules, which either requires if it's a primary uh, origin, it required that the ordinary chondrites accreted more molecular ice than carbonaceous chondrites. However, a uh, secondary origin is also possible where there's significant loss of hydrogen through oxidation of iron metal by water that uh, enriches the residual water in deuterium. When we calculate how much water can diffuse into glass, the, this is comparable to the chondral diameter, suggesting that the extreme deuterium enrichment in chondral glass might be due to diffusion of deuterium rich water from fluids into the chondrules. Thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot, Kay. Um, please. Uh, attendees write your questions in now, and um, I'll start off with a question. When you're analyzing the chondrules with the ion probe, um, you gave an example there where you were going in and looking at the glasses. How, how, do you, how do you make a measurement of a very heterogeneous chondrule that has a lot of different phases in it and put that back together to get a reliable DH and uh, bulk water content? Uh, so I want to go back to that. Um, so what we've done here is to measure several of these different parts of the chondral to see how homogeneous the DH ratio is. Um, and we see there are some hot spots, but the DH ratio seems to be fairly homogeneous between different chondrals. And um, the other thing that we do is we do imaging of uh, the ions. And so what we have is an actual image of the ions that come in from the sample. And we can sort of make sure that we're looking at the glass. So we overlap the SEM image with the ion image to make sure that we're looking at the glass specifically. Okay, thank you. Um, I've got a question from George Cody. Um, who asks, would not water react with glass, not just passively diffuse into it? For example, C4 glasses near spreading centers are altered to clays. Right, so it's a good point. Um, we don't see 
uh, clear evidence of devitrification in our chondrules. Um, but it's been shown experimentally that water can diffuse into glass without devitrifying the glass. And so our thought is that it's possible that there, the DH ratio is getting affected even though we don't see yeah, the glass getting entered in the obvious way. Okay, and uh, one final question from Ying Wei Fei is, what is the explanation for the different DH values for one of the sample? I'm not sure which one he's talking about. Um, uh, yeah, I guess QUE maybe, or? Uh, so I think you might be referring to Semarcona, which shows an extremely large range in the DH ratio. And our hypothesis right now is that there's different uh, generations of water in the parent body. So during this secondary uh, sort of oxidation process, there is different types of DH ratio in the residual water. And one possibility is that some chondrules record the sort of late stage water that got very, very deuterium rich, whereas some chondrules are recording um, DH ratio that's closer to the original. Um, and um, it's there is some correlation between the chemistry of the glass and the DH ratio. And so our current idea is that some co uh, glass compositions are easier to uh, diffuse the water into compared to the others. So that, that's one explanation for the heterogeneity that we see. Right, okay, thank you very much. Um, oh, I have one more question. Last one from uh, Nicole. Can the DH ratio be fractionated during chondral formation because chondrules formed at high temperatures? So I think because they formed at high temperatures, the isotopic fractionation factors are quite small at these extremely high temperatures of somewhere around 1700 Kelvin. And so we're more, it's something that we need to look into, but based on the high, high temperature, we think that something like the secondary origin or um, water ice scenario is more likely. Okay, thanks so much, Kay. Um, if you could stop sharing your screen now, and I will now uh, move Foibos on to a uh, panelist. Uh, Great. Hey, Foibos, just tell me if you can hear me. I can hear you. Okay, and uh, just confirm that you can see my PowerPoint presentation. And I can see your PowerPoint presentation. Great. Um, and just for, for the, the speakers to know, um, I'm gonna, I turn my video off during the talk, and when you see my video come back on, that's kind of me hovering over you like we're um, up on the podium uh, and uh, <clears throat> meaning to start wrapping up. So you can take it away, Foibos. Okay. Uh, thanks for organizing this and having us here uh, under these circumstances. So I just want to say that this was supposed to be a poster in LPC, so it was converted into um, a talk. Um, there are not very intriguing final results, but there is a preliminary study and approach uh, that uh, personally I find interesting. I hope that you will find it too. So what we're doing is that we try to investigate um, the seismic data from uh, generated by a meteoroid airburst that happened on July uh, 25, 2018 uh, in Greenland uh, in a place called Kanak uh, that uh, you can see the location uh, on the uh, map that uh, is figuring um, on the on the first on this first slide. Um, so the outline will be the following. I'm gonna explain briefly what how do we use uh, when we're doing planetary seismology how do we use 
at the Meteorite events for the planetary exploration. I will go through some properties of uh, the seismic source that is uh, associated to meteoroid events. Uh, then I should explain some things about uh, the shock waves that are generated. And then I will go through the uh, examined event uh, by uh, giving some details about its properties, um, presenting how we model uh, the shock wave that is generated. Uh, I will go through a review of seismic data and I will present our next steps, the, the seismic modeling and the version of how this can be applied to other bodies and can serve as an analog on Earth. So um, this is an introduction just to understand how do we um, consider uh, the meteoroid events in different uh, planetary bodies. This is um, this uh, scheme comparing Earth, Mars, and the Moon with the different atmospheric properties. Um, so uh, depending on the density of, of the atmosphere, uh, the, an object can be totally um, fragmented and destroyed in the atmosphere of, of the planet or create a blast, a, a shockwave while it's entering and traveling into the atmosphere uh, before reaching the ground uh, or with the absence of an atmosphere, for example, the moon, we don't have an airburst at all. We don't have this atmospheric shockwave and we have only an impact uh, and then a source, uh, a seismic source or a nonlinear source, a shock wave, but only in the solid part of the body. So we are interested in this case um, for terrestrial analogs uh, for places that they have dense atmosphere. So um, when we have this dense atmosphere, the most probable uh, thing is that any object, uh, okay, we don't have so uh, often uh, such big objects to uh, reach the ground of the planet. We never had one the last uh, hundred years on Earth, uh, for sure. Um, so uh, in any other uh, bodies like Titan or Triton, for example, uh, we can use uh, these uh, uh, seismic source as an analog on Earth. So I have to explain a little bit how it works uh, a meteoroid as a seismic source. In this schematic um, figure, you have M0, M1, and M2, which is the uh, time, uh, 0, 1, and 2, where the meteoroid of mass M uh, is located. Uh, and you can see in this line, I hope that you see my cursor, right? Okay. Um, you can see um, the trajectory of the meteoroid. So imagine that you have the blue part is the atmosphere of the planet and the uh, brownish part is, uh, the, sol uh, is the solid part. Uh, so while as the meteor is traveling with a high supersonic speed uh, in the atmosphere, which is related to its cosmic speed, it has nothing to do uh, with uh, the uh, gravity, that, uh, that the gravity effect is very minor in this case, um, creates a blast which can be represented by this kind of ballistic cone. So you can imagine that this ballistic, um, uh, this blast is uh, propagating uh, outwards uh, like a cylinder uh, from, uh, uh, from an axis which is, a, which is indicated by the trajectory of the meteoroid. If we want to uh, represent uh, this propagation, this outwards propagation um, as uh, an effect of seismic source, we can imagine that we have several consecutive sources in the atmosphere. And then you can uh, imagine this as an explosion. Uh, and then in the explosion, for example, take M1, uh, you can see with uh, continuous uh, lines, the propagation of a shock wave, a highly nonlinear uh, wave, which means that we have a high overpressure in the atmosphere that then converts into an acoustic wave, uh, which is uh, indicated with uh, the dotted line. Same things happen in the solid part. Then we have the shock wave uh, propagating near the source, and then we have the seismic waves, linear seismic waves uh, that are propagated. However, we have also uh, this kind of uh, secondary generation of se seismic waves that can happen by um, 
when the blast is uh, meeting the interface between the atmosphere and the solid part. All this just to explain that is um, a complicated source that we have to take into account all this trajectory uh, until M1, if we talk about an Airbus, in order to understand how the source works. So um, a, a basic concept is that when, uh, when an, an object uh, travels in the atmosphere with a supersonic uh, velocity, then it creates this kind of Mach cone uh, that it has an angle named beta, uh, which is related to uh, its uh, speed. Um, and actually, when the speed is too high, the beta is too small. So uh, in the cases of meteoroids uh, with their cosmic speeds, the beta is so small, smaller than one degree that we can represent this Mach cone as a cylinder. And this cylinder uh, is... Uh, uh, is uh, corresponding to the blast wave that I was showing previously. So in this blast, uh, in this uh, cylinder, uh, we have this kind of overpressure um, generated, overpressure compared to the pressure of the ambient atmosphere that is highly nonlinear in the beginning. And then as the wave is uh, traveling in distance and time, of course, and this overpressure tends to decline and then we have a propagation of a linear uh, acoustic wave in the atmosphere. You can see this effect in this very nice video coming from, um, from a Russian front uh, window in a car. Uh, this is a Chelyabinsk superbolide, and you can see this kind of tail, um, which is uh, this uh, sonic blast, and then uh, they find the terminal explosion when uh, the uh, uh, meteoroid uh, was destroyed in uh, the atmosphere. Um, so, but here I'm not talking about Chavis, I'm talking about Kanak, and we don't have such a video, but we have data. And we have data from a very nice place because there is a seismic station uh, named Tulek uh, of the Danish uh, Seismographic Network, um, uh, which is about 40 uh, kilometers, 40.7 40, 40. 70, uh, 57 kilometers far from uh, the epicenter, the projection on the ground uh, of uh, the final explosion of uh, this meteor, which according to CNEOS, with, um, which is uh, the service that monitors these uh, near Earth orbit objects, um, happened in an altitude of 43.3 kilometers and the released energy is estimated at 2.1 kilotons of uh, TNT. Uh, the meteoroid speed uh, is was 24.4 kilometers per second, and uh, uh, and you can see on this map uh, where exactly it took place in a very uh, very um, high latitude, uh, so in a very icy. Uh, region and this is why this event is particularly important because we have the chance to have such a source in a place where we can uh, provide estimations. Uh, we can do this experiment in a place where there is an icy shell. Uh, uh, in this uh, small fraction of this map, you have the relative um, the relative position of uh, the meteoroid airburst and uh, two leg station so you can see that two leg is just on the south uh, of uh, uh, the meteoroid and i should also tell that the trajectory of the meteoroid was from uh, west to east um, so so first of all in order to understand uh, the process we have to model the um, atmospheric uh, model, um, the atmospheric properties, and these are uh, on the top of, uh, uh, you have, there are the uh, properties of uh, the, the atmosphere given by the NR, NRLM size 00 model. And uh, this is the atmospheric density in the lower 100 kilometers uh, for, uh, of altitude in the atmosphere and this is the temperature. So uh, having these data, we can 
uh, we can compute the sound of speed in the atmosphere. And we take the lower 100 kilometers, even if uh, the airburst obviously came from uh, uh, higher, because as you can see later, um, the any contribution of uh, an interaction with the object uh, with a thin atmosphere above 100 kilometers is really uh, non-important for, for the problem. Uh, so uh, if uh, we take the sound of speed and we just use the provided velocity uh, by SNEOS, uh, you can see that this was um, uh, relatively high number um, for, for the, uh, that represents the speed of the meteoroid. In the final explosion, uh, this Mach number uh, is estimated at about uh, 74. So uh, if we try to understand how the shock waves that were generated by this meteor um, were propagated, we have to take and implement some uh, relatively common theory uh, for uh, the shockwave generation. And uh, in this theory, we consider an observer in a distance uh, from the trajectory, and then we take a point of the trajectory that is generating the shockwave. And then we can model um, how uh, this shockwave, uh, this overpressure um, evolves uh, while the uh, wave is uh, is propagating from the source to the observer. So you have here the distance uh, from the source of the wave to any observer that can be uh, in axis X. And you can see that the overpressure here, there is the overpressure over the ambient pressure of the atmosphere, um, is evolving into dif two different um, uh, parts. This is the nonlinear part that is characterized by uh, a rate of uh, one over a distance square. And then this is uh, the um, linear part, uh, which is uh, one, one over um, distance to uh, up to three quarters. So the thing is that our station uh, is located somewhere here in 40 kilometers. So what I want to show here is that we expect to see um, the acoustic nonlinear waves in our station and not the shock wave directly. Uh, so when we go to our seismic data, these are the high frequency data. And uh, you can see in about 191 seconds, a very strong indication of um, a, a relatively high frequency uh, wave arriving uh, in, um, in the in Tulek station. Uh, how, I should tell that these kind of data you don't have to consider anything because if you take a longer uh, time scale, you will see many of them uh, during the day. So also this is a species to not be related uh, with uh, the meteoroid. Uh, so this is this should correspond to the acoustic wave and uh, we cannot. And then the question is if we have any seismic waves that are secondary waves. So if the airburst uh, coupled uh, a wave with a solid part, and then uh, it, um, uh, and then it was, and then this secondary seismic wave was uh, recorded uh, by the uh, by the instrument. So, um, so if we want to look at this, we and we and if we do an exam, a, a small thought experiment, and we take a nice um, ice. Um, uh, ve speed, velocity of P waves of about four kilometers per second, we will find this place, uh, this uh, time given somewhere here. And um, this is a wave uh, that we can see in the uh, relatively low frequency seismic data. Here you have just one to three hertz, uh, whereas here you can see that well, we use zero to 50 hertz. Uh, so we are in this region somewhere around here, and this uh, corresponds really well to a wave that is generated just in the epicenter of uh, the airburst 
uh, by coupling the uh, shock wave in the ground. However, with the orange line here, uh, I indicate the time when we, where we expect the acoustic wave to arrive and we might uh, have uh, these detection uh, also here in the beginning of the low frequency seismic data that you can also observe uh, here. So why all this is important for us, and I will conclude with this, uh, my talk, and the importance is if we can model uh, this seismic wave. And in order to do this, we use an already uh, developed uh, technique that um, uh, computes uh, the, uh, the a line source uh, in the atmosphere, the meteoroid, um, as, a, as a source of, consisted by consecutive uh, other sources. And um, we estimate um, through, uh, th through the relationship of the released energy and the seismic efficiency uh, given by Lognonet uh, in um, a paper for Schumacher-Levy Comet. Um, and by using the atmospheric model, we can compute how the moment tensor uh, should uh, vary uh, as the uh, pro as the meteoroid enters the atmosphere. So um, this is not done yet. This is our next step. However, however, this technique has been used before in order to do full wave form modeling. And uh, why all these? Because with full wave form modeling, we can do an inversion of uh, the local structure. And uh, this was this technique, this inversion of the local structure was the subject of um, my LPSC 2019 poster. Um, so it's something that is already developed and, um, and shows that it works. Uh, and um, all this is important because we want to test it on Earth in order to go and do it in other places. For example, Titan is a planet that there is ice, yeah, there are icy regions um, there is also uh, just solid part regions that doesn't have to be ice, but in our example, uh, we are focused in the uh, measurement of the icy shell and has a uh, relatively dense atmosphere in order to uh, have uh, airbus that are destroyed within it. And we can perform these kind of experiments with a future mission carrying short period seismometers like Dragonfly. Uh, thanks for your attention. Thank you so much, Phobos. Okay, anybody have a question you can write in? Um, I'll start out. I'm curious about insight and, and, and whether or not you can easily distinguish a, an airburst type of seismic source relative to one that's coming from in the interior of the planet. In other words, is, is this a clear fingerprint? Okay, I have to be very careful on this because uh, I'm uh, I'm participating on inside team, and um, there are things that are not uh, yet uh, uh, concluded within a team. Um, however, uh, what I can say is that in every kind of public published events, um, we do not have any kind of meteoroid um, signal detected and confirmed that is like this. Um, so the thing is that what is important in meteoroids is that, for example, on Mars, we can have a, a, another kind of detection to associate it. For example, a formed crater um, or a flash. Um, however, on Mars, it will be mostly a flash because um, I can tell you something. Uh, take, for example, a small, a very small object that will be destroyed in the thin atmosphere of Mars. It should be very, very close to the, our seismometer in order to detect this um, these acoustic wave. Um, otherwise, uh, if the object is uh, big enough in order to reach the Martian ground, then it will, uh, it will generate uh, an impact and then the waves that are associated to the impact will be of much higher amplitude than the airburst one. So uh, it's a completely different case um, uh, than 
planets with relatively dense atmosphere. This is what I can right. say with some certainty now. Thank you. Um, I have a question from Peng, and, and uh, what he was wondering is about the meteorite itself and whether the type of meteorite, rocky or iron, um, affects the, the nature of the acoustic wave. Um, at some point, um, yes. Uh, ha however, uh, to be honest, um, in, uh, in, 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 while we use this technique and we implement this theory, one of the important, um, one of the values that we use is uh, the uh, diameter and of uh, the meteorite considering the shape as a spherical one. And the other one is uh, the mass. Uh, so it means that the density of the meteorite is uh, contributing uh, in this. So um, of course you can understand that um, an iron meteorite, uh, meteoroid um, will be um, will be destroyed differently in the atmosphere by the friction um, than, uh, for example, a rocky one. Um, I cannot go through all the details now because I don't have the relationships in front of me, but uh, if you need an answer, yes or no, the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, I think um, in the interest of time, we'll move on. Thanks again, Povos. And um, I'm going, if you can quit sharing now, I'll, I'll move Hope to a panelist status. Okay, you'll, I see you now, Hope, you'll need to unmute. Okay. Can you hear me now? I can hear you, thank you. And... Yeah, I can see. Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, my name is Hope Tornabeni, and I will be talking to you today about the insights to the genetics, age, and crystallization of group 2C iron meteorites. So the 2C iron meteorite group is a small magmatic group currently consisting of eight members, and the 2Cs are shown here along with the other major um, iron meteorite groups on this plot of nickel and weight percent and gallium and ppm in logarithmic scale. And as group two irons, uh, the two Cs only have a minor depletion in volatile siderophile elements compared to say the four B irons, which would have uh, major depletions in volatile siderophile elements. And so for this study, we have used laser ablation inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry to analyze the bulk composition of meteorites by averaging data for multiple laser tracks. And we use isotope dilution to measure the HSEs in bulk samples using inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry. And the rhenium osmium isotopic analysis was done by thermal ionization mass spectrometry. And to account for cosmic ray exposure effects, high precision osmium isotopic analysis was done uh, using thermal ionization mass spectrometry. Uh, but none of the meteorites that we have analyzed here display any cosmic ray exposure effects, uh, so I won't discuss that any further. And the isotopic analysis of ruthenium, molybdenum, and tungsten was done to assess mass independent isotope effects using thermal ionization mass spectrometry. And so all 2C meteorites uh, were analyzed by laser ablation and are plotted here on a chondrite normalized abundance plot where elements on the x-axis are listed from left to right in order of decreasing condensation temperature. And overall, the 2C group shows a minor depletion in the more volatile siderophile elements uh, with major depletions in the multivalent elements, vanadium, chromium, phosphorus, and zinc which is consistent with a somewhat oxidized parent body, because in an oxidizing environment, multivalent elements will tend to partition into the mantle rather than the core. And this is consistent with the major depletions shown here. And one 2C, uh, Wiley, that has previously been classified as a 2C, um, has a very different chemical composition than the other 2C irons. And for this reason and reasons that I will discuss later on, uh, we conclude that Wiley is no longer a 2C iron meteorite. 
And so the remaining seven 2C ions were analyzed by isotope dilution, and they form nested patterns here with a little overlapping of lines. And this minimal crossing of lines is important for a simple fractional crystallization model. <clears throat> and the fractional crystallization model we use here, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, calculates solid metal, liquid metal partition coefficients using the parameterization method from Chabot et al. 2017. And we calculate d-values using these iron domains. Um, <clears throat> uh, the iron domains are calculated because this presence of sulfur and phosphorus within a metallic melt will greatly affect the partition coefficients of the highly siderophile elements during crystallization. And so for this reason, uh, we calculate these iron domains to monitor these effects. And so then we calculate uh, liquid and solid compositions uh, using the calculated D values from above. And so this is an example of our best fit fractional crystallization model. And all of the 2C irons are shown here as the colored symbols um, on a plot of rhenium and PPB and rhenium osmium ratio. And we use rhenium and osmium for this model because they are the best measured HSEs and because we assume that their initial concentrations were in uh, chondritic abundances. And the gray star shown here is, uh, represents the starting liquid composition falling at the lower range of chondrites shown as this gray area. And the gray line is the uh, liquid track representing equilibrium liquids. Uh, this black star uh, would represent the first solid to crystallize from a metallic melt, and the black line is the solid track representing equilibrium solids. And the dotted lines connecting the two are mixing curves um, connecting the liquid and solid track at 5% increments. And our best fit model uses an initial sulfur and phosphorus content of 8 and 3 weight percent. And so all of the 2C irons can be accounted for in this model because they all fall between uh, this solid and liquid track. So Dorinskaya and Untermassing fall along this solid track and rep would represent uh, crystallizing solids from an evolving liquid at uh, 10 and 26% fractional crystallization. And the other 2C irons that do not fall along this track would represent mixtures of the equilibrium solids and trapped coexisting liquids. And from our best fit model, we can calculate HSC concentrations throughout the crystallization sequence. Uh, the figure on the left here is our modeled results where Dorinskaya in blue represents the first 2C to form at 10% fractional crystallization and untermassing um, at 26% fractional crystallization. And these black lines are calculated HSE concentrations at 2% increments. And so as you can see, our fractional crystallization model, um, these lines stack on top of each other and they do not uh, cross, which is consistent with the observed uh, 2C patterns that are shown on the right here. And so our modeled results are in very good agreement with our observed patterns. And any discrepancies uh, between these lines in the middle can uh, be accounted for by equilibrium solid, like solid melt mixing. So from our model, we can calculate a parent body core composition that has also been done for the 4B uh, South Byron Trio and 4A uh, iron meteorite groups. And the 2C pattern is similar to that of the 4A pattern, which is consistent with their similar nickel contents. And if we assume that the 2C parent body is chemically similar to that of average carbonaceous chondrites and all HSCs were partitioned into the core, then the 2C irons are six times that of average carbonaceous chondrites. Um, and the 2C core would comprise approximately 17% the mass of the parent body. Uh, so this initial HSC concentration for the bulk core and coupled with uh, the moderate nickel content for the 2Cs suggests a moderately oxidized parent body. And so I'm going to switch gears here and um, discuss, discuss some of the genetics of iron meteorites. Uh, genetics here meaning their isotopic compositions. And so uh, two genetically distinct nebular domains are observed in bulk meteorites, likely reflect reflecting the incorporations of different proportions of uh, nucleosynthetic components. 
And so recent studies have identified a dichotomy of molybdenum isotopic compositions between non-carbonaceous type irons and carbonaceous chondrite type irons um, here on after abbreviated as NC and CC. Um, so the NC type irons are characterized by AS process deficit. Um, and the CC type irons are characterized by an even greater S process deficit coupled with an R and or P process excess component. And the NCCC dichotomy is best seen on this uh, plot of mu molybdenum 94 and mu molybdenum 95. Um, both the NC and CC type irons show these nucleosynthetic isotope anomalies. Uh, where the NC type irons fall along an S process mixing line, while the CC type irons uh, form a distinct cluster. And just to note, all of the data here is uh, from our lab and are all iron meteorites and corrected for cosmic ray exposure uh, when necessary. So the two C irons and Wiley show the greatest enrichment in uh, molybdenum 94 and 95 observed in iron meteorites. And um, as I noted before, Wiley's isotopic composition is different from that of the 2C group, which is consistent with Wiley forming on a different parent body. And uh, since the 2Cs and Wiley's isotopic composition differ from that of the CC cluster, it may indicate that they are an extension of the CC cluster forming their own S process mixing line, or may represent an additional nebular reservoir. Um, so all uh, previous Previously analyzed uh, iron meteorites have plotted on a line termed the cosmic correlation, uh, which is best seen on this plot of mu molybdenum 97 and mu ruthenium 100. And the two C's and Wiley plot to the right of this cosmic correlation. However, you would expect the S process deficit observed uh, for molybdenum to have a complementary deficit uh, in ruthenium, which is a pure S process isotope. And they should plot along this cosmic correlation um, envisioned by these gray symbols. Um, but this is not observed. So, uh, so this may require a decoupling of ruthenium and molybdenum. Um, or again, it may suggest an additional nebular reservoir. And so again, a similar trend is seen um, for the 2C irons in Wiley on this plot of mu tungsten 183 and mu tungsten 182. Uh, where tungsten 183 is a nucleosynthetic isotope and represents a genetic signature. And tungsten 182 is a reflection of time, uh, where time is plotted on the other y-axis and reflects the core formation ages relative to the ages of CAIs, uh, which are believed to be the earliest formed solids in our solar system. And again, the 2C irons and Wiley um, have the greatest enrichment in mu tungsten 183, and they do not plot with the CC cluster. And so hafnium tungsten model ages for the iron meteorite groups can be determined from their tungsten 182 composition, coupled with assumptions regarding uh, precursor hafnium tungsten ratios. So the average tungsten 182 value of the 2C group corresponds to a model differentiation age of 3.2 plus or minus 0.7 million years after CAI formation. And this age overlaps with an uncertainty of all other CC type bodies, um, but is the only iron meteorite regroup that is resolved from all NC type bodies. And the average tungsten 182 value of Wiley corresponds to a model differentiation age of 3.8 plus or minus 1.4 million years after CAI formation. And so Worsham et al. in 2019 uh, noted that the NC type irons are characterized by correlated variations in uh, molybdenum and ruthenium, yet they have homogeneous tungsten 183 compositions. And alternatively, the CC type irons are characterized by correlated uh, molybdenum and tungsten 183, uh, but homogeneous uh, ruthenium 100. So to account for this inconsistency, um, Worsham et al. noted that the isotopic homogeneity observed for tungsten 183 in the NC domain and ruthenium 100 in the CC domain um, is best explained uh, by assuming that each domain was initially homogeneous, 
uh, with respect to the isotopic compositions of molybdenum, ruthenium, and tungsten. And then isotopic heterogeneity might have been introduced for some elements as a result of heating, variable volatilization, and partial loss of some elements or their pre-solar carrier phases. And so the Worsham et al. model um, proposes that under more reducing conditions and higher temperatures, which are commonly envisioned for the NC domain, um, it's been proposed that molybdenum and ruthenium species would have been more readily volatilized than tungsten, which would have preserved uh, the tungsten 183 isotopic homogeneity, but causing molybdenum and ruthenium isotopic heterogeneity observed for the NC domain, shown as the shaded red regions in this figure. And then under more oxidizing and lower temperature conditions commonly envisioned for the CC domain, they propose that molybdenum and tungsten may form volatile, volatile oxides more ready, readily than ruthenium, leading to the preservation of ruthenium isotopic homogeneity and variable loss of tungsten 183 and molybdenum isotopes shown uh, by these blue regions. And so to summarize this briefly, um, they propose that chemical and or thermal processing would generate the more isotopically anomalous compositions such as the 2C irons and Wiley. So the proposed differences in oxidation states between CC and NC domains and the coupled selective volatilization processes proposed by Worsham et al. Uh, to create these mass independent isotopic heterogeneity might be expected to result in complementary chemical effects. Um, for instance, the 2C ions in Wiley might have depletions in uh, molybdenum and tungsten, um, which would accompany their isotopic heterogeneity of these elements in CC ions relative to NC ions. Um, to test this, we can compare chemical compositions of a number of isotopically distinct meteorites. And so a comparison of CI chondrate normalized abundance plots of Wiley and the least chemically evolved irons of uh, the 4B South Byron Trio uh, 2C and 4A groups are shown here. And Durinskaya and Wiley uh, show no discernible depletions in molybdenum and tungsten relative to the other CC or NC type meteorite groups. And so thermal processing could also be expected to result in the loss of other volatile siderophile elements, uh, such as gallium and germanium, uh, which is not evident in uh, the group 2C ions or Wiley, uh, because they, are, they have comparatively high gallium and germanium abundances relative to other CC ions. <clears throat> So the model of Worsham et al. also requires that the CC domain and the 2C ions in Wiley to have formed under more oxidizing conditions than the NC domain. And the average iron nickel ratio of a group is normally assumed to reflect the proportion of iron incorporated into the silicate shell of a planetesimal relative to the core. Um, so the 2C parental melt pattern is similar to that of the 4A parental melt pattern, as I noted before, with, consistent with their similar uh, nickel contents. And so the nickel content of the 2C core um, can provide insight into the relative redox conditions of their core formation environment. So the least evolved meteorites from the 4B South Byron Trio 2C and 4A uh, groups have an iron nickel ratio of 5, uh, 4.2, 9.2, and 10, while the average iron nickel ratio of C chondrates is 17.4. Uh, so the 2C system is characterized by, by an only a moderate depletion in iron relative to nickel compared to that of the 4B and South Byron Trio um, systems. And this is assuming that the nickel enrichment was a result of oxidized iron remaining in the silicate shell. Uh, so this suggests a moderately oxidized parent body, but one that was less oxidized uh, than the 4B and South Byron Trio parent bodies, which are also CCs. And so um, our results indicate that the 2C parental melt um, uh, composition was formed under less oxidizing conditions than other CC type bodies. Um, and the 
so the 2C iron data do not really provide evidence for a more oxidized formational environment compared to other iron groups. Uh, so we are not necessarily arguing against the model of Worsham et al. Uh, for these genetic isotopic observations, uh, but the data for the 2C irons in Wiley allow the possibility that the solar nebula uh, included genetic domains in addition to the NC and CC domains and that additional evidence for a greater genetic complexity in early formed bodies might be discovered. Uh, so I will just leave you with uh, these conclusions and thank you. Thank you very much, Hope. Okay, so questions are open. Um, I'll start out with one. So if you take your fractional crystallization model and you apply it then to some of the moderately volatile elements like gallium and phosphorus, which seem to vary widely in this group. Um, does, does, do those parameters work out? Can you, can you apply the same models to those and explain their abundances and possibly get back to the initial um, concentration of those elements in the parent liquid? Um, so the gallium, for instance, is uh, le we don't model uh, gallium. We can, but it's less certain um, than the other HSEs. Uh, the rhenium, osmium, iridium, ruthenium, platinum, and palladium. Uh, so we don't normally uh, look at gallium, but for phosphorus, we, uh, we estimate an initial phosphorus composition by taking uh, the partition coefficient calculated from Chabot et al. 2017 and dividing it by the phosphorus composition of our least evolved iron. And that gives us a general idea of where that initial phosphorus should be. And we can take the fractional crystallization models. Um, let me go back here. Such as, so if we do rhenium and osmium, and then we can apply the same model for platinum and platinum osmium. And we generally know that the model uh, is consistent if uh, you can see the same trends um, I want to make sure this makes sense. You would see Derinskaya crystallizing out at this 10% um, as a 10% solid and Untermassing crystallizing out as a 26% solid. Mm -hmm. And uh, for this 2C group, uh, we do see consistent results for um, rhenium and osmium with platinum and osmium. So we, we can do other tests for this. Right. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions? You can write in now. Um, okay, if there's no other questions at the moment, thank, uh, thanks again, Hope, and thanks to all of our morning speakers. So it's time for a lunch break, and uh, what we'll do is we'll start back up at one o'clock sharp. Maybe everybody can start tuning in at about uh, 10 or five minutes till one o'clock um, so we can uh, have an on-time start. Okay, so thanks, and we'll see you all later.
Gabor, are you online by any chance? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, sorry, it was muted. Steve, are you on? Um, Steve asked a question about whether or not um, I've, I've um, suppressed the participant window and the chat window because apparently he can't see the chat window. Uh, at this moment, I am uh, sharing my screen and uh, Okay, now Steve says he can hear it. Okay, or he can see it. He can see the chat window. Okay. Okay, cool. Because if just on the, the uh, bottom part, there's a chat. He clicks on the chat, it should uh, ap uh, appear. You can see it. Now he says he can't see the participant window. Steve, can't you? Participants. Uh, yes, because he is, as I know, he is just an attendant, not a, a panelist. Uh, right. Yes, yeah, Steve, you can only see the participant window if you're a panelist. <laughs> That's right, mate. <clears throat> Uh, let me know when I uh, can finish my uh, screen sharing with this beautiful screen. Um, okay, so we'll, as soon as Lynn gets on, let me see if he's here. Um, yeah, Lynn's on. I'm gonna, Lynn, I don't know if you can hear me, but I'm going to make you a, a panelist. There he is. You can, Okay, Lynn, if I can, uh, I think you're a panelist now. You can unmute and share your screen. Right, okay, thanks. Ah, oh, there you are. It's okay? Super duper. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. Awesome. And then you can use your cursor, hopefully, as a, yeah, there you go. Yeah, it will. Okay. Yeah, yeah okay. the mouse should work as uh, we can see the mouse movement. So it's like a, a laser pointer. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, I can see the attendees loading up fast and furious. Thanks everyone for coming back to the afternoon session of LPSC, brought to you by Zoom. Um, we have four talks in the afternoon. I wanna remind everyone that if you have a question, uh, please do type it into the chat box. Um, I'm watching the chat box and we'll, and we'll ask uh, the question to the presenter. Uh, if you're a presenter, um, just before your talk, um, I'll load you into a panelist mode um, and you can share the screen uh, with us then. We'll start in just, uh, just another minute. Okay, so our afternoon session starts off with a talk by uh, Lin Wang, and um, Lin will talk to us today about stress-induced percolation of core-forming melts in a Bridgmanite matrix. So take it away, Lin. Okay, thanks, Mike. So I will talk about the stress-induced percolation uh, of core-forming melt in Bridgmanite matrix. So we know that the co-formation uh, mechanism is easy to solve for two reasons, at least. One is that it determines the heat structure of a planet. So we know that the iron will transfer its potential energy into heat during uh, it move to the core. If the segregation is very fast, it will increase the core temperature. In the other hand, it will increase the mantle temperature a lot. Uh, in the other hand, it will determine the composition of uh, Earth's core and of the siderophyte element and the, the, uh, the light element abundance in the core. We see that the side element in the mantle uh, is lower than the contrast ratio. This is mainly due to that the core takes the side element. And in the other hand, we see that there are some light elements in the uh, Earth's core. So how the core forms and how fast uh, it is and whether it's equilibrium or not will influence the uh, element abundance in both mantle and core. So there are several mechanisms for the metal silicate segregation. So generally it can divide it into two groups. One is liquid, liquid segregation, namely that liquid iron segregate uh, from the liquid silicate, namely magma ocean. Another is that uh, liquid solid segregation. So in this catalog, we can divide it into the uh, segregation due to really tidal instability, means that due to the density contrast, Iron may form a diapere and descend to the mantle, or it will crack the mantle and form a deep crack and uh, uh, move down. Uh, another mechanism uh, occurs on much smaller scale, namely green scale. So it migrate on the green boundary, namely percolation. So in this talk, I will uh, talk about this uh, topic. So before we go further, we need to know why we need liquid solid segregation, why, uh, mental, uh, why magma ocean is not enough. So the depth, uh, the easy answer is that magma ocean is uh, not deep enough. So we can estimate the mental, uh, the magma ocean depth by using the partition coefficient uh, of satellite element. So previous people using nickel and cobalt. So we know the nickel and cobalt in the mantle, we know it in the uh, core. And then we can see the uh, uh, partition coefficient between nickel uh, bet, uh, of nickel and cobalt uh, change with pressure and temperature. And then we estimate the magma ocean depth because we assume that there is a completely equilibrium uh, of solid and uh, of silicate and uh, liquid iron in magma ocean. So this is the calculated diagram. So within the reasonable oxygen frequency, we see that the depth of magma ocean is about pressure of, of 40 to 60 GPA, not deep enough. In the other hand, this is deep enough to reach the bridgmanite stability field. Therefore, in Earth, the liquid uh, bridgmanite segregation is important. So uh, what is percolation? Percolation is that the mat move uh, along the green boundary and uh, 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 so we can divide it uh, into the hydrostatic, condi uh, hydrostatic condition percolation and dynamic condition percolation. So at hydrostatic condition, the percolation behavior is uh, controlled by the 
solid solid interfacial energy and uh, uh, solid liquid interfacial energy. The ratio between these two give us the dihedral angle theta. So we see that if this dihedral angle is uh, smaller than the 60, it will form an interconnecting network. Otherwise, the melt will remain isolated at the triple junction. So at the dynamic condition, uh, whether the melt can form an interconnecting network is controlled by the balance between the stress and surface tension. If stress is high, the melt can be elongated and connected to each other. In the other hand, if surface tension is very high, uh, the stress cannot deform the melt pocket, but can only move the po uh, melt pocket as a whole and finally cause the size of melt pocket increase. So there are some previous study on the percolation behavior in bridgemite, but all of them are focused on the hydrostatic condition percolation. So we see that at a relatively lower pressure, for example, 25 GPA, this dihedral angle is higher than 60, which means that percolation is impossible at reasonable melt fraction. In the other hand, in diamond MVC experiment, when pressure go higher, so this dihedral angle decrease uh, to lower than 60 degree, which means that at higher pressure, percolation is possible. So from this uh, hyd uh, hydrostatic condition experiment, people think that percolation is not possible at pressure less than 50 GPA. But before we reach this conclusion, we need to remember that the core formation is not at a hydrostatic condition, it occurred at a dynamic condition. So there are at least two reasons to cause the mental flow. Why is that after the impact, it will have an isostatic adjustment. So mag motion will cover through the whole mantle, uh, the whole surface of earth. And uh, correspondingly, the mantle will flow to fill the gap uh, left of the, by the mag motion. And another thing is that the mantle are continuously convecting. So these two uh, factor will make a dynamic condition for co-formation. So the purpose for this study is to check the connectivity of iron sulfur at a bridge magnet matrix. So I first synthesized iron sulfur alloy uh, in bridge magnet matrix, and then I do comparison experiment. For group one, I only high pressure temperature near the uh, this sample. And then uh, for another group, I go high pressure temperature annealing and then I deform. So I compare the melt texture between the undeformed and the deformed one and uh, see whether the stress can cause some difference. So this is my experiment setup. I use two alumina piston to share the sample. The sample here is put in a platinum uh, holder. So something like this one. So I put sample inside and when I go to the target pressure temperature, I increase the oil pressure again. And then due to the uh, material strength difference, this direction and this direction, so it will simple share my sample. The reason why I use the platinum holder uh, are falling. First, the platinum has high bulk modulus, means that you will not shorten your sample during compression. Second is that it have lower yielding stress compared with a uh, bridge night. Uh, so it will not present a uh, resistivity during shading. And uh, the most important thing is that I use platinum as a connectivity marker. So uh, in my understanding, if the uh, match in the bridge night form an interconnecting network, then when it touch the platinum, then platinum will move inside and then give us a hint whether the uh, match are connected or not. So here is the result. This is a sample after a synthesize. We can see iron sulfur distribute homogeneously in region matrix. This is the sample after annealing at high pressure and temperature without deformation. We see that the iron sulfur still remains a spheric shape. And this figure we can, is a magnified image of the melt. So we see the quenching texture. So it means that temperature is high enough to melt the uh, metal. And this is the deformed one. So we see that the melt are elongated. And uh, more importantly, we see that there are platinum inside the melt pocket. So besides this uh, platinum contaminated melt, we, still, uh, we also find some uh, platinum free melt remain. So as I said before, if the melt are interconnected with each other by deformation, then we should see the platinum in the melt pocket. So then we do the uh, platinum mapping. 
this uh, undeformed one, these two are deformed one. So we see that in deformed one, platinum are inside the mad pocket everywhere through the sample. In the other hand, the platinum are only in the mad pocket at the boundary between sample and platinum holder. Therefore, we think that the mad in the bridge line matrix first form an interconnected network and then touch the boundary, uh, touch the platinum holder, and then platinum migrate inside. I, uh, we should emphasize that because the MED first form an interconnected network and then touch the uh, platinum, so there is no effect of platinum on our result. Uh, using this method, we can also uh, <coughs> tracking the MED channel. So uh, if the MED pocket are connected with each other, then we uh, should uh, see that uh, the platinum uh, content in the MED pocket are similar. So this is VSE image. So generally the brightness reflect uh, the platinum content uh, in the MED pocket. We see generally two big bands here. So they have different contrast of metal. And uh, this is due to platinum difference, uh, content difference in the MED. And, uh, but inside each band, we see the uh, brightness is similar, which means that platinum content is similar uh, in each MED pocket. So we conclude that this is one big MED channel and this is another. So we see that the MED channel are connected uh, throughout the sample. Another evidence for the interconnectivity is that the iron uh, in the platinum holder. Uh, so we, me uh, we measure the iron content in the uh, platinum holder at the same distance in the defo deformed one and undeformed one away from the boundary between sample and holder. So we see there are more iron in the deformed sample compared with iron in the undeformed uh, sample, I mean uh, the platinum holder. So this indicate there are more iron flux uh, go to the boundary. So this is a sign of interconnectivity of match. So our result, our experimental result suggests that stress can uh, pr uh, introduce uh, interconnectivity of iron sulfur liquid in bridge band matrix, but that's only experiment. We need to scale to the real earth. So in experiment, stress are very high, but in real earth, the stress is much lower. So before we doing this scaling, we need to understand the physics behind it. So stress will cause the elongation of mad pocket. In the other hand, the surface tension will cause the, the mad pocket rounding. So these two effect competing with each other. Therefore, we can using the minimum radius of mad pocket, which are elongated to represent the lower limit of the stress dominated region. In the other hand, we can use the maximum uh, radius of the mad pocket, which are not elongated to represent the upper limit of surface tension dominated region. And from previous study, these two ratio uh, is equal to minus 0.3, so it's a constant. So for our experiment, uh, the maximum, uh, the minimum uh, mad pocket which are elongated is here. So this is a minus 0.3 slope. And this one is a maximum uh, radius uh, of mad pocket, which are not elongated. This is uh, the uh, minus 0.3 line. So we see that above this line, uh, the mad pocket are large enough so that the surface tension is very uh, is small enough that stress is dominant. And uh, below this line, the opposite thing occur. So the current earth have the mad uh, pocket, uh, the uh, liquid size, uh, in millimeter size and the strain rate between 10 to minus uh, 12 to 10 to minus 14. And in early earth, because of the more vigorous convection and large impact, it should have higher strain rate, therefore move the, this triangle to this direction. So we conclude that the early earth, the, uh, the liquid are controlled by the stress. Namely, it can form an interconnected network as experiment showed. And uh, then whether the, uh, we can reach chemical equilibrium or not, uh, we can see that uh, this is a percolation. Uh, so, so we see the magnified image here. These are two channel and uh, the distance between them is Rm. And there are diffusion of satellite elements from channel to the solid. So the diffusion distance is dm. So which equal to the square root diffu uh, diffusivity times time. 
And this uh, diffusion time is determined by the segregation velocity and the mental depth. And the segregation velocity can be written in this way. So we can see it proportional to the D square where D is green size and to the mat fraction. So you can see that if this RM is higher than the DM, so we have the disequilibrium. And we can see if D increase, then the uh, V increase, VM increase, then the time decrease, therefore the DM, uh, this DM decrease. So there should be a critical uh, green size for each uh, mat fraction, which can random you where RM equal to DM. So here I use green size uh, as the distance between two merit channel. So after calculation, we can see this diagram. So these are green size versus the merit fraction. So we see that at large green size because the segregation velocity is high, so we have disequilibrium. At low, uh, small green size because the segregation velocity is very slow, so we have equilibrium. So the co-formation condition is around here, namely green size about millimeter size and the matter fraction about 0.1 to 0.3. So we see it indicate there is a disequilibrium co-formation uh, by percolation mechanism. Uh, finally, let's see uh, how the stranded merit uh, implication. So except uh, the most platinum contaminated uh, merit, we find some uh, platinum free merit. So we counted the, we calculate the volume fraction. So it's about uh, 0.04. So we think this can be represent how much mat remain in the mantle after co-formation. After co so actually our result uh, support inefficient co-formation model. Uh, so we think uh, because the stranded mat has the chondritic uh, HSE abundance. So if there are some uh, remaining uh, mat remain in the mantle, so it can explain why the hydro, uh, highly satisfied element has chondritic ratio. So we're using the uh, uh, CI uh, platinum abundance in the CI contract and uh, calculate how much uh, remaining merit are needed to explain the uh, HSE we, abundance we observe in the mantle. So calculation indicate there are only uh, 0.7 weight percent uh, merit remain can explain the HSE abundance in the mantle. So our, uh, our experiment give a 0.04 volume percent, which is about one weight percent. So these two are generally consistent with each other. Therefore, we think the late veneer is not so necessary for the Earth. So here is the conclusion. So we see that the stress can, introduce, uh, can induce a co-forming merit to form an interconnected network. And uh, we also uh, uh, concluded that if the grain size is larger than 0.3 millimeter, the population is fast enough to make a solid mantle disequilibrium with the merit. And then we have some remaining uh, merit in the mantle after co-formation, which can explain the HSE abundance in the Earth mantle. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Um, open to questions. I'll, I'll start with one while you guys are typing yours in. Um, so you've said that about 0.04% is the minimum melt fraction before which you get connectivity, um, which is pretty similar with some earlier results in non-strain non samples. But I'm wondering how the total amount of strain will affect that result, or if you think it will. And the other question related to that is the composition of the, of the iron, it, of the melt itself. And uh, it wasn't clear to me that we're, whether you're using pure iron sulfide or some sulfur alloy and how that might change if it's pure iron metal. Okay, so first, uh, uh, the total strain in my sample is very small, it's only 1%. And uh, therefore, uh, in, the, uh, in the earth, the total strain must be higher than this. And with increasing strain, I think that uh, this interconnected should be more apparent. Therefore, in the uh, real earth, this phenomena should be much more clear. And uh, in, my, in our experiment, the sulfur is a uh, uh, five weight percent. Uh, I don't know the effect of the uh, chemical uh, effect to the uh, final result, but generally uh, for this dynamic uh, uh, percolation, uh, the important thing is the balance between the surface tension and the stress. So 
uh, from a uh, five weight sulfur to the zero weight sulfur, I don't think the surface tension of the marriage changed so much. Therefore, I don't think it will change our result. Okay, thank you for that very clear answer. Okay, I've got two questions uh, online so far. One from uh, Larry, who asks, how do you go from 0 0.04 volume percent to one weight percent? Surely iron sulfur isn't 25 times denser than Bridgmanite. Okay, yeah, so for this 0.04, I just uh, using the density of iron and then density of Bridgmanite, and then I transfer this. Okay, so it is, so it is 25 times more. Yeah. Okay. Um, another question from Hung is, in the slide for the HSC calculation, what is the mass percentage for the mantle versus whole earth that has strained metal? Uh, could you say that again? I didn't get. And he's asking, what is the mass percentage for the mantle versus whole earth that has strained metal? Okay, uh, so you can imagine we have magma ocean, we have solid earth uh, below. So we have some uh, 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 stranded metal, uh, stranded metal there. But after the magma ocean solidifies, this uh, metal will go up, and then uh, we have another magma ocean again. So we will continuously uh, move the metal stranded in the mantle from uh, the lower mantle to the upper mantle. Okay. Any more questions? Okay, here's another one from Larry. Also, how did you define those bands in the SM, SEM image to define melt sheets? It wasn't clear that platinum was more concentrated there. Right, so let me show you. So this one, uh, I marked the boundary between uh, the very sharp, uh, 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 by looking at the brightness of each melt pocket. So here and here we see the uh, sharp contrast of between the mat pocket. So here uh, and inside each this one, the brightness of each mat uh, pocket is similar. Therefore, we think it's one band. And for this one, so for example, here and here, the brightness is similar. Then we think they have the similar platinum content. Then we think it's one band. Right. Very interesting. I wonder if you could use a piece of metal that was had, had <laughs> that was composite with different with different kinds of hsc metals and then you could trace the contamination across um with the metal content anyway yes. just, just an idea for a very complicated experiment um any other questions if not let's thank uh lynn again and we'll move on to the next talk thank you Mike. which is jessica thanks lynn okay there you are jessica you'll need to unmute All right, can you hear me? Yes, great. Okay, great, excellent. So today I'll be talking about retrieving dust properties of the Aumic debris disk, a possible forming planetary system. So because this was an LPSC talk, I have a slide here starting with why study debris disks, which I may or may not need for this audience, but I'll go through it anyway. So planets are formed during a relatively short time frame in the first um, tens of millions of years of a stellar system's lifetime. And initially, the host star is encircled by uh, a protoplanetary disk consisting of dust and gas. And various processes um, dissipate the gas over time, and you're left with belts of dust uh, that are continually replenished by uh, collisions of larger bodies um, grinding the dust down into smaller sizes. 
Debris disks have been compared to various structures in our own solar system, like uh, the zodiacal dust and the Kuiper belt, depending on the location and temperature of the dust within the particular system. So debris disks provide a window into the planet formation process. And so that's the, the first, um, let me make, let me see if I can do the annotation. Yeah, so they provide a window into the planet formation process, which is one reason to study them. And another is to help understand the composition of dust, comets, and planetesimals in other solar systems. And finally, for AUMIC in particular, um, light curves from the test mission together with near infrared radial velocity data have shown that there are two candidate uh, planets orbiting within this debris disk, the inner one having a mass of um, roughly Saturn size and the other one having a mass of roughly uh, 1.3 Jupiter masses. So it'd be really interesting to see the context in which these um, planets are forming. How do I go to the next slide? Next, okay, great. So um, AUMUK itself is located around 9.9 um, .9 parsecs from Earth. It's an M-type star, and the star is roughly 10 million years old. And the system is edge-on, meaning if you uh, envision the dust as a sort of giant hula hoop, the hula hoop is uh, oriented horizontally relative to Earth. So you just get this, um, you just get a, um, this sort of, uh, it looks like a bar, right? When the way that we're looking at it. Okay, on the left, you see an image from HDS uh, STIS. So it's an imaging spectrograph um, with a coronagraph, which uh, makes use of a, a slit and a culting bar to produce spectra of the disk as a function of uh, angular distance from the AUMIC star. So you can see the yellow boxes um, in this cartoon are indicating uh, locations in the disk at which spectra uh, were collected. And um, that way we can see if the, the spectra change as a function of um, location in the disk. And then on the right, I have um, just an image of the disk as it looks in 1.6 microns. And on the bottom uh, here, what you see is uh, images of the disk taken uh, at different times. So what we see is these uh, clumps of material that are moving, which indicate that some process such as stellar wind or unseen planetary companions are doing something to stir up this disk. Okay. So this is a, uh, the previous uh, slide I had a schematic of these different spectra as a function of distance from the star. And in this, I'm showing the actual uh, spectra for the both sides of the disk, the Northwest and the Southeast. And what you can see is that if you look um, as a function of wavelength, the uh, areas that are closer to the star have this bluer slope, meaning that there's more flux at shorter wavelengths and less flux at longer wavelengths. Whereas if you go further out, it looks uh, flatter. There's no particular color. Okay, so we wanna understand whether this change in um, spectral slope is an indication of a change in grain properties or if that is a function of the light scattering response, which is dependent on the orientation of the particles relative to um, the star and, and Earth. Okay. So to model the light scattering properties of this disk, we start with known dust grain properties from ALMA, which is um, a millimeter instrument. And so McGregor 24, 13 found the known outer dust belt and an unresolved inner dust belt. And these contours here are the ALMA data overlain on the, one, um, the um, HST STIS image here. So you can see that the larger grains that are detected by ALMA 
uh, have don't have as much of a radial extent as the visible disk. Let's see, so to model the disk, we start with um, the inner and outer edge um, that was derived from Alma. We start with the surface density profile. And also I should add that we, um, we take that surface density profile for this inner disk and we merge it with the surface density profile that is derived from even longer wavelength data to capture what's going on outside of um, where Alma is able to detect the dust. The disk mass was derived to be about um, one mass of the, our moon. And um, they assumed that the minimum grain size is the blowout size and then could derive the temperature and maximum grain size. Okay, um, so we take that as for the, the shape of the disk and the extent of the disk. And then the next thing is that um, in addition to composition, the light scattering is dependent on the shape of the grains. So we know from our own solar system that uh, dust from a wide variety of sources takes on complex porous structures. And we expect that the dust in debridis exhibits also such diversity. Uh, for example, interplanetary dust particles have a wide variety of shapes. And um, so on the bottom here, can everyone see my cursor? I can. Okay, great. Yes. So here we have an example of an interplanetary dust grain, and then I have some examples of uh, lunar dust grains, and we can see that they're highly non-spherical in shape. And then also we have similar observations from Rosetta's Cosima instrument, and these are likely large uh, fluffy dust grains that were then broken up uh, when it actually hit the collector plate. Okay. So uh, in order to actually calculate the light scattering properties, we use um, an implementation of what's called the discrete dipole approximation from my co-author of Evgeny Zubko. And uh, in this way, we're able to calculate the light scattering properties of irregularly shaped dust grains. Um, in the discrete dipole approximation, the, um, you have an array of polarizable points that can approximate the response of the continuum target on length scales that are large compared with the interdipole separation. So as long as all of these uh, little dipoles are small relative to the uh, grain that you're trying to calculate the scattering properties for, it's all good. See. So those shapes that I showed in the previous slide are um, assembled in this way. I have a, on the left here, we're looking at a figure from Vidin et al. 2015. And so you have seed particles that can be different compositions that are input into the lattice. And then the empty lattice points take on the composition of the nearest seed point. And that's how we build up those sort of shapes. I should also note that when we're calculating uh, the scattering properties of these uh, irregular grains, we average uh, several hundred of them such that um, we get an average set of properties that are not related to the exact shape or orientation. Um, and because we expect there to be quite a lot of dust in this disk, we're not looking at only a few grains, we want sort of the ensemble properties. Okay, what I'm, uh, the most in important thing for looking at uh, scatter light is to derive the phase function, which is just the how much um, light is reflected back as a function of uh, scattering angles. So the light will hit your particle and some of it will be scattered uh, back towards you and some of it will be scattered backwards at different angles. And so this is just a plot showing that response function. And I have here two little arrows. Uh, the dashed line is, are the agglomerate to particles, which are irregular particles, and the solid lines are the uh, spheres. So what you can see is that the dashed lines for these two different uh, sizes, and I'm using X, which is the size parameter, because in light scattering, we always talk about the size of the grain relative to the incoming wavelength. So you can see the dashed lines have a different behavior than the spheres, which is the, the um, 
me scattering approximation, especially for these larger grains, you can see in the pink, you get the resonant behavior of the me spheres that we don't see for these irregular particles. And then the other gray lines on this plot are the Henny Greenstein function, which is often used as an approximation. And you can see that uh, neither the spherical particles nor the irregular particles look very much like the Henny Greenstein function. Of course, we're usually looking at um, ensembles of particles, so not a single grain size, but a uh, power law distribution, because that's thought to be what you get when you have this collisional cascade. And so what I'm comparing is the, the power law we typically use, three and a half, to a somewhat flatter distribution, just to, so that you can get the idea of how uh, this behaves. And again, the similar coding, the dashed lines are our regular particles and the solid lines are the spheres. And so you can see the backscattering behavior. So that's the higher angles here is very different between the two types of particles. Okay. Another interesting that thing that we can look at that I don't really go into in this talk is the polarization. And these two types of particles have very different behavior in the polarization, as you can see from this plot. Okay, so now that I've discussed how we get the phase function for our grains and um, how we get the model for the disk uh, from ALMA, now I talk about how we actually fit the dust grain uh, properties. So we use an EMC Python package, which is in um, which is an MCMC Markov chain Monte Carlo model, which is um, used to sample from a assumed prior distribution. And in our case, I'm using flat distributions for everything because we don't have um, a, sen a sense statistically what we think uh, the composition should be. So I just say, okay, for each um, composition, it's either gonna be some fraction between zero and one, we don't know. Um, and okay, so we also assume that the disk is optically thin since we don't have gas, we have mostly dust. So what, what I'm actually fitting is two parameters for the grain size, which is the minimum radius and the uh, power law slope of the distribution. And then for composition, I'm drawing from the complex refractive indices that have been measured in the lab listed in the many, many papers here. Um, so what I'm fitting is the volume fraction of all these different components. And then what I do is I calculate the phase angles, project the disk in 2D and extract the modeled spectra and compare that with the actual measured spectra. Okay, so these, um, yeah, so the, the distributions that you get for each parameter from the MCMC make for these big corner plots that aren't great for presentations, but I'll go into it a little bit later. So the first thing that you can see on the right here are the modeled spectra in these solid color lines compared to the measured spectra. Now, from what I showed earlier, I've binned the wavelengths um, in order to speed up the MCMC. So I've averaged over uh, several wavelengths so that I have fewer points to, to fit. And so there are error bars here, they're just really small. Uh, so what you can see is that for the spheres, what we model is um, somewhat brighter than the actual measured spectra. So the um, compact spheres aren't a very good fit. And then the other thing I can do is then model what the, um, an image of what the disk actually looks like. All right, then next I'm showing a similar figure for our irregular agglomerate particles. And what you can see is that these actually provide a decent fit to the change in slope. Uh, using the same dust parameters throughout the disk. Although what the um, interesting thing is that there are some individual features here, which I'm pointing out that um, aren't captured in the model, but the general change in slope is captured. Okay. And so what I'd like to point out in this giant corner plot is that both models have a relatively small minimum grain size, so around 0.2 microns. And the second thing I'd like to point out is that the uh, mass of dust uh, derived from each model is different. So then the uh, compact spheres, we get a mass that's very similar to what's derived from ALMA, which is uh, not what we expect because this doesn't include the larger grains. So the irregular particles give us a slightly uh, smaller um, 
derived mass, which when you extrapolate that to the millimeter grains gives you something that makes more sense. The problem is that as you can see from this plot, some compositions are highly correlated. So each one of these is looking at each parameter I'm fitting versus each other parameter I'm fitting. So when you're looking at these compositional parameters here, which are the fractions of the various components that I'm using, you can see some of them are have a, a linear behavior, meaning they're correlated. So it may be hard to tell, um, for example, between something like troilite and iron, which have a similar spectral slope, how much exactly there is, or between water ice and silicate, since they're both um, less absorbing exactly how much of each there is. Uh, but what we can see from the model is that it's quite likely that there are silicates in the disk. Okay. So next I'd like to discuss why I think the small minimum grain size makes sense. And it's because um, this AUMIC is not a very luminous star. It has a somewhat lower temperature. And that means that radiation pressure doesn't have a very big effect on the grains in the star. So beta is a parameter that we use to measure the effect of radiation pressure. And this black line um, is beta 0.5, meaning anything over that line can leave the system and anything under that line will stay in the system. And bas basically for any composition, you can come up with any shape of grain, most of the dust is expected to stay in the system. Here I'm showing uh, again, why the minimum grain size makes a big, big difference to your spectra. So if you have a small minimum grain size, you see that most of the spectra have this blue slope that uh, we see in the observations. And then if you increase the minimum grain size, that slope uh, flattens out. Okay. Uh, what's interesting is that some of the other observations point to a separation in grain size, or at least some break in the grain size distribution uh, after 40 AU. So uh, Graham et al. looked at the linear polarization of the disk uh, at different separations from 10 AU to 100 AU. And they noticed that this um, polarization increases, meaning that they, they concluded that the disk is depleted of small grains, which is not what we're seeing from the uh, scattered light data. And um, this table is kind of uh, busy. Uh, but it's just to show that the, this disk has been studied a lot. And what the data that I'm fitting have a bluing trend toward the star, but other data uh, in other bands have a uh, bluing toward the outer disk. And like I said, uh, a lot of papers have the conclusion that this, the inner disk is depleted of small grains. Okay. So looking to longer wavelengths, an interesting thing we can do once uh, I've modeled the uh, visible and near infrared scattered light is to look at longer wavelengths. So um, especially interesting is the band around three microns, which occurs for water ice. And what I'm showing here is um, a model of wavelength versus the ratio of the disk flux to the stellar flux. And this is just for various compositions. And then in black, I have my model composition. Um, and then, let's see, I, we can do a similar thing as I showed before where we um, model an image of the disk. So uh, in conclusion, a more realistic grain shape is a better fit to the disk spectra. It fits the overall slope change, but uh, doesn't capture some individual features that are within the spectra. A small minimum grain size makes sense given the weak influence of radiation pressure from uh, AUMIC on the dust. Uh, silicate grains are likely to be present, but there are many degeneracies in the composition. And it'll be interesting to see if the longer wavelength spectral energy distribution can be fit with the output from the scatter light model. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Um, please type in your questions now. Um, I'll start off with one or two. Okay. Um, my first one is when you're looking at the disks, um, it looked like a number of, of the pictures you showed were in dawn images. So does that mean that you're looking through a thickness which would be an integration of a lot of distances? Yeah, so I may have gone through that part uh, a bit fast, but if I go back to where I describe the model, I'm actually uh, calculating, right, I'm taking the, the disk uh -huh. model from the uh, Meredith's paper, 
and then I'm calculating the phase angle for the uh, the dust in each sort of like little 3D voxel, and then I project that in 2D. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Good. Um, one more question that I have is, especially at the visible and near infrared, um, is there is there um, is it compounded by any thermal emission from uh, the grains? No. So I realized later on the talk that I, I had skipped the part. So the temperature of this disk is quite low. So we're talking 40 to 50 Kelvin, which is uh, one, why we're not too worried about uh, thermal emission until we get to much longer wavelengths. And two is why we're not using like the 8 to 10 micron region that we use for looking at Mars or the moon. Right. Yeah. OK. Um... I don't see any further questions. Anybody have a question? Want to type real quickly? If not, thanks so much, Jessica, and we'll move on to Alan. How do I stop? There we go. Yeah. Oops. Uh-oh. Sorry, Alan. Um, try that again. OK, you should be ready to go. There you are. Okay, you can hear me? Yes. Okay, thanks, Michael. So today I want to bring up to date on some work that uh, Connell and I have been working on for the last decade or so, along with Morris Podolak, our collaborator from Tel Aviv. Uh, we've been trying to figure out a way of making sure that uh, we can use meteoritical uh, evidence from uh, real genuine samples from the solar system to constrain the sorts of work that I do on trying to understand planet formation in the, uh, in the solar system in particular. So this is a continuation of work that's been going on for about 10 years or so. And the motivation for this particular work I'm talking to you about today is the fact that uh, astronomers know very well that young stars are very active uh, systems, that um, typical theorists' idea of a smoothly evolving uh, la laminar uh, viscous accretion disk is not necessarily a disk that uh, characterizes all phases of young stellar evolution. Particular astronomers known for a long time that young stars, t stars, which the sun was, a, was one for early in its life, uh, go through what are called Efiorionis outbursts. And the, uh, the image shown there shows uh, Efiori itself, the prototypical uh, star of, of the, uh, that name. On the right-hand side shows a couple of other Efiori's uh, stars with different names. And their key, key, key characteristic is that they, uh, they're sitting along uh, very young stars, and maybe 100,000 to a few million years old, and then suddenly they brighten up uh, over a period of about a, maybe 100 days or something, they brighten up by five magnitudes, which means 100 times brighter. And in order to explain that sudden outburst of, of luminosity, it means that the mass that's being accreted on the growing star has to increase to a rather high mass accretion rate, for example, of the order of 10 to the minus four solar masses per year. You can imagine for, did that for 10,000 years, you'd accrete a whole other solar mass and you would double the mass of your star. So it's, it's gotta be a short life phase of evolution. You can see from the plots on the right-hand side that these things last for maybe uh, tens of years, typically. Uh, but if you do the statistics on how often they are seen around young stars, it, uh, it's believed that uh, every young protostar goes through uh, maybe you know, 10 or 20 or so of these episodes. So they're important phases of evolution early on. And the question is, uh, what does that mean for the planet formation process, which is probably already underway in these, uh, these stars? Because if they already have a fair amount of, uh, you know, maybe a half to one solar mass in the star and a much smaller fraction of mass out in the disk. And so planet formation is probably already underway. And the leading explanation for understanding how you have suddenly uh, a lot of mass pile up onto the protostar is that the disk may be gravitationally unstable, at least in some regions. And so uh, this just shows you a typical uh, one of my marginally gravitationally unstable disk models from a paper I published a while back with Dick Durison. Well, the motivation was uh, uh, was not so much Efiorionis um, models, but just trying to understand how one could uh, produce uh, chondrules by shock heating. So this shows you a 
midplane uh, density plot where orange means high density and black means very low density. Uh, calculation of a disk which is on the verge of being unstable, it's making spiral alarms, it may or may not go on to make gas giant protoplanets, which is one of my motivations for studying these sorts of disks. But regardless of that, if it's making spiral alarms, it's going to have implications for the particles that are in the disk. And in fact, in this particular model, the motivation for publishing this was that that very inner region, which is a 1AU hole at the center, uh, you'll see it's uh, sort of 12 o'clock, a sort of a black region where it's a very low density gas, which is rotating counterclockwise into a purple region. And that shock is basically oblique to the uh, motion of, uh, of the gas and particles. And so that means that the particles at around one to two AU will be hitting a rather sharp shock and going through the same sort of thermal processing that chondrules are thought to have uh, formed uh, to end up with their uh, li liquidy and compound chondral uh, lithology. So um, this was a firm motivation for trying to do the sorts of work with Connell that we've been, we've been doing for some time, but uh, the same sorts of disk models can be used to think about what might happen to CAIs, the uh, centimeter size calcium and lumen rich inclusions that are, are thought to characterize the, the very earliest solids form in the solar system. So well, we published a paper back uh, eight years ago now, showing that if you uh, actually put centimeter sized particles inside one of these marginally gravitational stable disks, you get some rather interesting results come out. Namely, they, they uh, in, a, in a simple disk, a uh, simple monatomic disk, the particles were usually thought to just, uh, through gas drag, disappear into the protosun rather quickly. But if you have one of these rather interesting spiral alarm disks, uh, that's not the outcome that, that you always get. So uh, in particular, here's one particular particle from that paper that we published, uh, just showing that the particle has started out one centimeter radius in a disk and it started 2 AU, a uh, rather warm region of the disk. Uh, but because of the interactions with the spiral arms, both through gas drag and through uh, the uh, transport and drag forces uh, and gravity within the disk, a particle could uh, wander around, bop up and down and take a long strange trip throughout the disk. And this particular case it ended up wandering out towards the outer edge, so that towards the right-hand side, uh, it ends up uh, in this model, just uh, once it hit the outer boundary at 10 AU, it was, uh, uh, the coating was such that you're just gonna stay there forever. So it went up to the outer region of the disk and sat there. And so here's a particle that starts in the very inner region and ends up going all the way out to 10 AU instead of disappearing down into the protosun. And normally in a disk like this, a particle of this size would disappear into the protosun in like 100 years or so. Instead, uh, over several hundred years, this ends up going in the wrong direction because of the transport by spiral arms. So uh, that is actually a wonderful way to explain the perhaps somewhat surprising discovery by Don Brownlee Stardust mission a while back of and the aerogels from Comet Will 2, this rather uh, cold uh, body that formed presumably in the outer regions of the solar system beyond 10 AU. Uh, they found at the bottom of these aerogel tracks, if you follow down where these aerogel was able to decelerate these high velocity particles, at the very bottom, there are these little guys, which are refractory inclusions, and some of them look very much like CAIs. And so uh, that's the sort of transport that was in our models was a very natural way to say, hey, if you had an F. Orionis phase early on, you can end up tossing some refractory particles way out to the comet forming regions where they could be trapped in uh, objects like Will 2. So, uh, Interesting part of that, uh, those sorts of calculations also is the thermal processing that goes by these guys. It's not just being transported, but they're going through regions of the nebula, which in these models were uh, thought were, were uh, to make it simpler to calculate, were just an axisymmetric temperature distribution with, with uh, hot regions in the inside around 1400 Kelvin and no cooler, cooler than 60 Kelvin in the outer region. So here's that same particle that starts very close to the central protostar at 2AU and uh, is going in and out, bopping in and out of hot and cold regions. Uh, it uh, you know, goes through several close encounters with the, the central regions where it's quite hot, but ends up at the end in cold regions. Question is what happens when it goes in and out of these hot regions? And so uh, that's where Morris Podolak came into the calculation. So I would feed to him the, uh, the trajectory information of one of these particles and showing what temperature and density and pressure it experienced. And in this case, it's that same particle. It starts off with a, uh, with a half centimeter core of, uh, of olivine with a half centimeter of ice on top. Now, this particular particle starts off in a very hot region. So if you look on the left-hand side, the, uh, the ice mantle just disappears right away because it says, hey, wait a minute, I'm too hot to have ice. So the ice disappears, but then it's carried forward in time. And as you can see, when the particle goes through the high temperature regions with uh, these, these curves here, 
uh, it loses a little bit of the of the uh, the olivine or melanite galenite and get various compositions here. It loses a little bit, but then gains it back again when it cools off because for simplicity, we assumed a closed system. So you might lose water, but you'll gain it back again once you get cold. It's just a very simple calculation to, it, to make the calculation simpler. Not necessarily, not necessarily realistic, but a good first, uh, first attempt. So the interesting thing is this, not only do you, uh, is this a way to move ice back and around the nebula, which has implications for volatile transport in the nebula, but you can also, uh, lose or add a refractory uh, layer to the outer core. And that is uh, the sort of thing that uh, is seen in typical CAIs. Here are some classic work by Justin Simon and colleagues showing the so-called work lovering rim on the outside of the CAI, which has a progression of different uh, minerals, no, like perovskite, pyroxene, sodalites, vanels, which all have their own uh, characteristic temperatures depending on the pressure for which they will either evaporate or condense again. And so that was one of our challenges to try to see if maybe we could explain the formation of these WL rims by the sort of thermal processing that um, one of these uh, centimeter sized particles would go through as it uh, evolved around the nebula. So in order to um, do some new models more realistic, uh, that's the focus of this talk. I've done some new calculations where I uh, put in, um, instead of having the temperature distribution be fixed, I allowed the temperature distribution to change with uh, in a normal, uh, one of my normal calculations where uh, not rate of transfer is used because that's really computationally intensive, but use so-called beta cooling. So here are four different models with uh, two different values of beta cooling. Beta cooling is basically the uh, ratio of the cooling time to the orbital period. So if you have a small value of beta like 10, that means you're cooling pretty quickly. Whereas if you're up to 30, that means you're not cooling quite so quickly. Uh, betas of 10 to 30 are usually thought to be the appropriate range. And in each of these models, either all of them start off with the particles in the midplane on the left in this uh, very simplistic array, just put uniformly out. Uh, but the, also the major new change is that they are now no longer restricted to be simply being in the midplane of the disk, but now on the right-hand side, you can see that they're also allowed to be uh, in, with vertical heights above the midplane. And you notice that the uh, vertical scale here is exaggerated. It's sort of like a, a five, to, five to one uh, scale height of the disk. Uh, so I'm putting some particles way up at the top to see if they stay there. Are they lofted up and down or are they all, uh, again, in a very traditional simple disk, you would expect all the particles to settle down to the midplane in a very short period of time. You just have a thin disk of particles. So that's gonna be one of the interesting things to see is what happens to these little centimeter sized particles as you evolve over time. So these models have been run for about a thousand years or so on the MEMEX cluster, thank goodness for MEMEX. Uh, even still with that fast cluster, these uh, models take uh, three or four months apiece to run. Uh, very simple, uh, uh, very, very not, not a very robust grid. I mean, this is a fairly low resolution grid, but it's sufficient for showing the, the case, uh, the points I wanna make here. Okay, so here's one of the models that starts off initially with the particles uniformly distributed, uh, but uh, the background is already a spiral arm situation. Rather than waiting for the spiral arms to develop, uh, the spiral arms are there. And that means that rather quickly, because the uh, spiral arms are density pressure and maxima, Density pressure maximas are where particles tend to move because of the effects of gas drag. And so right away, the particles get clumped around the spiral arms. So after 88 years, uh, you can see they, they pretty much look like the spiral pattern, which I didn't show, but uh, that's the underlying pattern behind this. Some of them have already moved in and been sort of created by the inner boundary at 1AU. I just leave them there. I say, you know, here's the end of the game for you, game over. By 352 years, there's still a lot of particles out there. Uh, remember, if this had not had spiral arms, particles would have been gone by now. They all would have been uh, stuck on this 1AU boundary. And even after 797 years, there aren't too many particles left, but they're still out there. And they're all the way out at the outer boundary. Some of them are still out at 10AU regions. And this calculation, anything that hit 10AU, I didn't say you stick there anymore. I allowed you to bounce off and come back in again. So these are all doomed eventually, end up uh, in the center of the protostar but they still, of course, manage to persist for quite some time. Okay, so what happens vertically, uh, here's the uh, upper left is where they're starting off. Uh, and by goodness, uh, they do settle down, but they don't settle down into a thin disk. Uh, in fact, there's very little sense of a, of a thin disk there at all. They're still being lofted quite a bit right on to the end of the calculation. It's still a thin disk. This is more like a, a 20 to one aspect ratio. There's in sort of a half of AU above the top and going up to 10 AU and allow them to end up in the inner boundary. But it shows that um, in these calculations with 
the active spiral density waves that the actions of the spiral waves uh, keep these things lofted. They do not settle down into a, a thin compact disc, which is the, of course the best case for agglomeration. Uh, this keeps them more spread out and they're more, more likely to survive and not uh, snack into another particle and do something different as, as the uh, plantesimal population starts growing. What's inter also interesting is what happens to the thermal uh, uh, temperature evolution of these models. So here is showing you that the models all start with the initial axisymmetric, this is in the mid-plane temperature distribution with an inner temperature around 1500 Kelvin. Uh, and then, it's, but instead of allowing this temperature distribution to just stay frozen like this, they're now the, with the beta cooling uh, as the spiral arms form and decay. This shows on the right-hand side, the, the temperature plots uh, after 94 years and showing you very high temperature regions where the arms are because of shock compression in the arms. In this case, it's the uh, crosshatch regions here are temperatures, you know, close to 1800 Kelvin, which is getting up there. That's, that's uh, gonna melt a lot of very refractory uh, portions of CAIs. Uh, so it makes things a lot more interesting. Instead of simply getting high temperatures by going in and out, in and out of this region here, even by moving around the same orbital radius, as you go in and out of these regions with spiral arms, you can get some interesting thermal processing. So here's uh, one part particle in particular. The left-hand side shows you its orbits in and out as it goes on these, one of these crazy journeys in and out of the solar nebula. Uh, and I, I didn't show you up and down on this one, but they also go up and down as well as in and out in radius. And the right-hand side shows the thermal, pro uh, thermal processing this guy goes to. It starts off with rather high temperatures, goes through some even higher regions where it goes through the shocks, cools down a bit. The, outer, the disk temperature, out, most of the disk is around 60 Kelvin, so it can't get any colder than 60 by definition. But it goes through several series of, uh, of high temperature events where it gets up to even, uh, even well over 1500 Kelvin. So uh, the importance of that is that if you go through and look at the those different minerals that I showed you in the, the uh, uh, Justin Simon CAI, uh, the evaporation and condensation temperatures of many, many of these minerals, depending again on the pressure they're at, are sort of in this range where something interesting should happen. And so this uh, these calculations are ripe for uh, passing on to uh, Connell and Morris to work on because they're the ones who uh, have done the thermal processing. And so that's sort of the next step of this calculations is to see what sorts of implications uh, these sorts of uh, thermal trajectories will mean. You know, can we actually make uh, a, a WL rim or not? And so uh, I'll stop now with these conclusions. Uh, the interesting thing is if you're in a outburst, give you a Strong support that is at least early on, the young stars have a phase of gravitational instability, which can do some interesting things. Whether or not they make gas giants is a whole other question, but at the very least they'll be processing grains. Centimeter sized CA type grains will end up, some of them will get tossed out to the outer region where they could end up uh, in comets. Uh, and uh, there's some really interesting stuff going on with these new models, uh, especially since some of these trajectories bring the centimeter sized particles up near the surface of the disk. You can imagine near the surface, there could be some UV pho photolysis processing going on that uh, could do some interesting things to, uh, especially for, for volatiles, uh, which, uh, so the, the implications uh, remain to be worked out in terms of the thermal chemistry of what's going on. Uh, but uh, I think it's an exciting project and uh, I'm looking forward to working more with uh, Connell and Morris on the implications of this. So at this point, I will stop and take questions. Thank you, Alan. Um, any questions from the attendees? You get typing. Um, I have probably some naive ones. Um, so at the beginning, you talked about. I think I think you said I might have written it down incorrectly. Um, that it was a doubling of the of the mass of the star, or was it five times? It was anyway. It was a large change in the mass of the star when it uh, to to initiate the Fu Orionis phase. No, no, I, I was saying that um, I was making the point that if it could, it's inferred that the mass accretion rate increases from what's normally maybe ten to the minus seven, ten to the minus eight, ten to the minus six solar masses per year up to ten to the minus four solar masses per year, and that that high mass accretion rate cannot be sustained for very long because if it did you would double the mass of the star so that i was sort of putting that up as a straw man and knocking ah, it okay. down okay gotcha because my yeah my question was going to be wouldn't that basically be the entire mass of the gas in the nebula <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Um, so that would be i mean something like that may happen but it'd be more what you would call the protostellar disk phase where essentially everything in the disk is going to be end up up ending up on the star whereas we're more interested in the later phases where you call it protoplanetary disk 
the stars mostly formed and you have maybe one or one or ten percent left in the disk to make the planets. Okay, I have a question that has come in from Larry. Um, CAI grains are 10 microns, not centimeters. CAIs in non-CV meteorites typically much smaller than centimeters as well. What about dynamics of smaller grain sizes in your model? Well, if you run, uh, we've run these models also for millimeter sizes. Uh, and uh, the millimeter sizes do not, uh, they, the smaller you are, the more strongly coupled you are to the gas. And so that may, things may not be quite so dramatic, uh, but they will, uh, they will undergo the same sorts of mixing uh, uh, in and out, uh, but they just stay a little bit more tighter, tightly coupled to the gas. If you're down to micron sizes, those really do stick with the gas. And so you're not really learning anything by putting in particles. You're simply just saying, well, where did the gas go? So it really gets interesting uh, when you talk about something where there's some decoupling from the gas. And of course, if you get up to meter or larger size, then that's a whole new ball game because they, they can do their own thing. So. Uh, if you're talking about, uh, I mean, like chondrules are also smaller than CAI, so uh, they have, they would have slightly different um, statistics for where they end up and where they go. Okay, great, thanks. Um, let's see, we had our first YouTube question from Thomas Burbai, but I think it's about the same question, what happens to particles that are smaller than a centimeter? Okay, I think you've, I think you've answered that. Uh, Thomas, if you have another question, please do chime in. Um, another question from George. Uh, so in the same stardust tracks that had high temperature silicate grains, primitive organic matter was also detected. Does gravitational instabilities facilitate mixing or do they segregate? You know, like, like I just said about the micron sized grains, the smaller type things or, or, or molecules, uh, gas molecules, they will be transported around the nebula as well. In fact, I did that a whole separate set of calculations where instead of putting in particles, I put in what's, what's uh, called as a color field. It's a, a field which just keeps track of individual parcels of gas. And uh, I showed that if you uh, sort of drop a little uh, ink, lit, uh, ink drop of uh, color into the inner disk and run it for a couple hundred years with gravitational stable disks, some of that color will spread outwards as well and end up in the outer disk. And so the same sorts of things goes for small particles or for uh, gases, uh, volatiles, uh, they will, you know, most of them are going to end up getting eaten by the protostar, but a significant fraction can end up being trans, can end up being transported outwards and the particles uh, just make a ver more dramatic case for it. If you're large enough, you can do even some more separation, but they all get mixed, they all get transported. Right. Okay, if there's no other questions, unless somebody's typing now, um, don't think so. Thanks again, Alan. And we will continue on with the next talk by Bradley Meyer. Correct? That's correct. Okay, Brad, you should be a panelist now. Okay, I'm trying to share the screen. Awesome. That's Got up? It. Yep, great. Okay. And you can hear me? I can hear you. Oh, excellent, okay. Good, let's see if I'm gonna hide something here. Um, Okay, well, uh, thanks for uh, letting me uh, be a part of this uh, very nice uh, event. I, I missed a little bit of the morning, but uh, the talks have been very interesting. So um, I'm, I'm glad to be participating. And uh, what I'm uh, going to present here is a, some, uh, a little bit of uh, calculations on, that are relevant to uh, um, uh, exploding white dwarf stars and the carriers of uh, some nucleosynthetic isotopic anomalies we see in uh, meteoritic samples. And this is work I've been doing with uh, Kath Birmingham and uh, Klaus Metzger. Uh, so let's see if I can move forward here. Let's see, why is my screen not moving? Am I locked or something? Um, you shouldn't be. I can hear your, I can hear the beat. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm using, <laughs> doing my, my usual, I can't even uh, escape here to go forward, so. 
can you, are you using PowerPoint or? Uh, it's Keynote. Keynote. Um, let's see. I don't use that. Anybody in the audience have any advice on Keynote? Yeah, it's, I mean, I've normally would advance, but uh, it seems to be locked here. Can you go into, um, is there a place in Keynote software for next slide? Uh, well, I'm a full, oh, there we go. Oh, there it is. There oh, maybe, it may, I'm, I apologize. Maybe I just have to click the screen. I apologize to everyone. Well, yeah, if, but, you, if your uh, screen locks and you cannot change one, uh, click multiple times on the screen when you have uh, the, the presentation, it's PowerPoint or right. It will Thank you. Apologize for that. Okay. And start Super, to great. Uh, I learn something new every day. I guess we're all getting Zoom experts here. And, That's right. And right. So, great. So um, the uh, the key observation that I wanted to uh, that we're 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 looking at is, or at least we're trying to get some sense of the, the initial building blocks in the solar system. And so, uh, this is through the isotopes, of course. And so, Kath has been uh, Kath has been compiling data, and some of this data has been around in, in various forms for a while, but the observation, there's some very interesting observations in, in meteoritic samples that you have these uh, correlations in, in, uh, in the meteorite uh, samples of these isotopic abundances. Here's, uh, here's uh, one very interesting case where you see uh, uh, anomalies in titanium 50 and calcium 48 uh, that, uh, that seem to go together. And in fact, roughly in a one-to-one -one ratio, uh, you see, we heard in the morning about uh, the NC and the CC. I'm, I'm not going to go into too much into into that very much, but uh, uh, this correlation uh, suggests that there is some carrier uh, that uh, that uh, is the cause of this uh, correlation, and uh, it could be something like a perovskite. Uh, similarly, here's uh, um, uh, the, a correlation uh, between uh, nickel and chromium, uh, and um, uh, you know the the ratio suggests maybe something like a something like perhaps a, a, a spinel or or something like that. So these would be these would be pre-solar grains that came in and uh, and were distributed through the disk and through various disk processes uh, uh, helped were uh, building up the uh, the larger uh, objects in the solar system. Uh, so let me uh, let me get at these uh, isotopes and and I want to go to the 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 nucleosynthetic source. And so what I want to talk about is the production of these light neutron rich iron group isotopes uh, because they give us a clue where they may be made. And um, so some of, the, some of them are uh, produced, uh, uh, there's some production by the S process of nucleosynthesis, the slow neutron capture process where we add neutrons slowly so that uh, beta decays occur quickly and we always stay near stabil stability. So some of the neutron rich iron group isotopes like chromium 54, uh, uh, calcium four, uh, well, not calcium 48, but uh, titanium 50 can be made by the S process, especially in massive stars. But uh, we, uh, we, we have significant pr production in a, in a dense low entropy environment, which is namely the uh, explosion of a white dwarf star. And so um, what do we mean by low entropy? And in, in when we talk in, in nucleosynthesis, uh, low entropy means that the Effectively, the temperature cube to the uh, to the mass density is is small. That is, the radiation pressure to to the gas pressure is a, is is small uh, is a is a small quantity. So that means that the uh, that the quasi equilibrium that the nuclei go into typically has too many nuclei compared to uh, what a full equilibrium would ask, and so that uh, that tends to favor light nuclei. In the equilibrium over the heavy nuclei, it's it's essentially if you have a pizza, if you cut it into into uh, in, into more uh, more pieces, the pieces are going to be a little bit smaller. And this is this is the key because a higher entropy environment can can tend to make uh, um, make heavier uh, heavier nuclei in the uh, in the uh, in, in the nucleosynthesis. And it needs to be dense because it has to. It has to be uh, high enough density to have enough uh, electron capture uh, to, to generate the required neutron richness that we have. So uh, we're looking at chromium-54, we're looking at calcium-48. These are neutron-rich species. Chromium-54, for example, has 30 neutrons and 24 protons, 
that's an excess of uh, neutrons uh, uh, to protons of one over nine, if you if you do that calculation, or or what uh, what we like to talk about a lot of times is the Ye, which is the net number of electrons per nucleon, or ef effectively the fraction of all the nucleons that are protons. If you look at uh, chromium 54, that's a Ye of about uh, 0.44. And calcium 48 is a YE of, uh, of about 0.42. So 40, 42% of the proton uh, of nucleons are, pro, uh, are protons and, and the remainders are neutrons. Those are fairly neutron rich species. So uh, before, I, before I talk about uh, uh, exactly uh, where that might occur, I just want to remind you that uh, the supernovae are, are in general, if you look at the core of them, they're, they're explosions of uh, a white dwarf stars of some kind. And so the explosion, it, it, the, the source of the energy of the explosion is, is either nuclear energy, uh, white dwarfs that ex uh, explode this way are thermonuclear supernovae. These are, these are white dwarf stars that have, have only managed to burn their way up to uh, carbon and oxygen or oxygen, neon and magnesium. So there is still nuclear fuel left in them even, even though they're even though they haven't uh, uh, evolved all the way up to iron, they, they, have, uh, they have that nuclear fuel left. They're supported by their degeneracy pressure. So the, the electrons are uh, so degenerate that they can hold the star up unless they, uh, the mass gets built up to a point where the uh, temperature rises and, and, and the carbon and oxygen or oxygen, neon, magnesium can, can start to fuse. And then that happens under a very unstable situation because the matter is very degenerate. There's a thermonuclear runaway. The whole star explodes and leaves behind no remnant. And the, uh, the other way that this can happen is that you have a gravitational collapse. And what, what ends up happening is part of the star falls down into the gravitational well and, and releases layers to uh, energy to the outer layers. And this is a core collapse supernova as opposed to a thermonuclear supernova. And this... Uh, this leaves behind a remnant. Some remnant has to go down the gravitational hole to, uh, to release the, the, uh, the binding energy that explodes the star. So uh, the sites that uh, we've speculated on for the production of these light neutron rich iron group isotopes uh, are either uh, of those two types. The, uh, initially, we were thinking uh, of thermonuclear supernovae, these very dense uh, Chandrasekhar mass white dwarf stars they had a high enough density to have the electron capture to create the neutron rich species. Uh, somewhat later, uh, uh, Wajino et al. Uh, uh, looked at uh, electron capture supernovae where what happened with the white dwarf star is that uh, you had electron captures occurring that removed uh, the pressure because you were removing electrons, you were moving the pressure that supported the white dwarf that caused the caused the white dwarf to start to collapse. It collapsed down and then it ejected some of the, uh, some of the remaining material outside of it. And uh, because of those electron captures, you drove the matter uh, neutron rich. And more recently, uh, people have been looking at, uh, uh, particularly Jones et al, have been looking at uh, super, what are called super AGB stars. These are, these are stars that are somewhere in the mass range, say eight to 10 solar masses, uh, which is, a, is kind of the boundary between stars that become uh, white dwarfs, the low mass stars, which eventually become white dwarfs, and the higher mass stars that we know explode as uh, you know, full core collapse supernovae. These, uh, these are funny uh, objects that uh, can start to collapse by electron capture, but uh, then they're, they're right on the hairy edge of whichever way they explode. The, the electron capture can cause a, uh, uh, the temperature to go up and drive a thermonuclear explosion, or if that's not quite sufficient, it'll actually do a core collapse. So, so they're right on the hairy edge of either being uh, what one would really call a thermonuclear uh, supernova or a uh, core collapse supernova. Uh, but uh, they, are, they seem to be promising sites for, these, uh, for the um, neutron rich isotopes. Okay, so since there's some ambiguity uh, about where they actually come from, I just have decided that I do know that, they that these isotopes have to come from uh, events that are, uh, eject neutron rich low entropy matter. And so I call them gnarlies. And so that's a generic term. A gnarly is an exploding white dwarf star uh, by whatever mechanism that ejects neutron rich low entropy matter. 
And so the, uh, the anatomy of one of these might be something like this. Uh, this is a, a white dwarf and it's actually kind of right after it's exploded, but that takes such a quick uh, amount of time that it still looks uh, more or less like this before it does its, uh, expands out into the interstellar medium. Uh, this object you have to think of is about the size of the earth, but has the mass of the sun. So it's quite high density. The innermost regions are the, uh, get to the highest temperature and they're also at the highest density. And that's where the electron captures can occur to drive the matter neutron rich. Outside of that, you have a, a intermediate mass species that get made all the way from silicon to uh, nickel. And these regions would not have any oxygen in them. And then on the outer layers, you have regions where you would have uh, burned some of, the, uh, some of the carbon and oxygen to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, so some of the carbon and oxygen and as some of the outer layers you would have uh, uh, burned to, excuse me for that, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, outermost layer would go to, uh, would not burn at all. And so they, here you can have lower temperatures where you leave over oxygen and uh, carbon. So in the innermost region, here's the YE. You start off with material that's uh, uh, got equal numbers of neutrons and protons. And then because of the high density, uh, as the matter heats up and, uh, and, and the explosion is going on, the electron captures can occur and they can drive the matter neutron rich. And you'll remember that the chromium 54 and the, and the uh, calcium 48 are made at, at YEs down here. And here you see the expansion time scale in this calculation. And so the faster, the faster the expansion, the less time you have for, for the electron captures and, uh, and the, uh, the higher the uh, YE that you end up with. And here we see that we have a, a, a low YE that we can reach. Here's uh, then if we look at the peak density of the matter in the, in the explosion in the innermost part, you can see that uh, uh, you know, at some point we reach high densities where, the, where we start to uh, get high enough in density in the explosion that, uh, that the uh, matter gets quite neutron rich. So if we look in this region, so we're gonna look here at the peak density and we're gonna look at the mass fractions of various species that get made. We have these in the innermost region uh, here in this, uh, in this uh, exploding white dwarf, we get to the highest neutron densities. You can see here's the, Here's the calcium 48. We see uh, um, other neutron rich species. We see titanium 50 and we see chromium 54. So these are all made kind of in the innermost part of, the, of this exploding white dwarf star. And then we get out to the outer regions where we start to make uh, lower uh, species with lower, uh, lower neutron riches, including nickel 56 here. Okay, in the, uh, in the outer part, uh, this is showing uh, the uh, uh, the carbon and the oxygen. Uh, the, you, here's the uh, here's the very surface here in this particular model, and we started with uh, uh, this. These were the mass fractions of uh, carbon and oxygen, and uh, as uh, as we go in this way, we see that the uh, the peak temperature in the explosion was uh, was higher, and so once we get uh, up to temperatures of around two billion kelvins. Uh, at, right around here in this, in this event, you see that uh, you burn up all the carbon. You start to burn some of the oxygen in this layer too, but that's, a, that's kind of a carbon oxygen burning. But then in the inner uh, regions further inside, you can make, um, you can actually uh, burn some of the neon back into oxygen here. And, but as once you get past uh, out into the, this region here, uh, the temperatures are higher and you burn up even all the oxygen into silicon and higher, higher mass species. Okay, well, just, uh, just because it's uh, uh, got, these, these species are interesting, I'm not really gonna talk about them in, in terms of the, uh, uh, of the isotopic anomalies, although they are, they are uh, showing up in, in, the, uh, in the data. Uh, this, this oxygen rich region, the little blue region here, uh, does get up to high enough temperatures where you where you make astonishingly large amounts of uh, p processed nuclei. These are these are the proton rich species. So this is uh, this is uh, strontium eighty four, and what you're seeing here is the uh, the overproduction factor. So this is the mass fraction of that species relative to the solar mass fraction uh, in this particular zone. And so you you uh, you make uh, you make uh, uh, in this particular zone, these, this narrow region, you make uh, strontium-84 at, at something like 10, uh, 10 to the five times uh, an enrichment relative to, uh, to the solar value. 
Uh, and then in the in the uh, in the this uh, lower temperature region in the outer part of the of the of the exploding star, you you make a, a fair amount of zirconium ninety six, which was quite surprising to me. Uh, what happens here is uh, is in fact uh, the material does have a slight neutron richness. So when the when the uh, when the that region heats up in the explosion, uh, then uh, what uh, what happens is that there's a, a sudden release of neutrons, and that drives the zirconium isotopes over to uh, zirconium ninety six. If the temperature is high enough, that happens in these regions. The te temperature that's high enough, it 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 goes out to to the zirconium ninety six. But then the temperature gets so high that it gets disintegrated back into uh, into its original form. So anyway, it's interesting that the, you you would expect to have uh, uh, regions here that have uh, high enrichments in uh, uh, strontium eighty four and and an area here where you expect to have a high enrichment of zirconium ninety six. Okay, so that's what I was saying right here, summarizing the uh, very neutron-rich iron group species here, and the carbon and oxygen will be out here, and uh, there'll be enrichments in strontium-84 and zirconium-96. But of course, if you're going to make these characters, uh, uh, carriers that we're proposing, you're going to have to somehow get uh, this material to mix in here. Well, that's not surprising because these, uh, these uh, supernovae are very messy, and so this is really just showing kind of what it might look like after one second, but uh, you've got, uh, it's actually a very, uh, very uh, complex multi-dimensional uh, explosion. And so it's, it, it's conceivable, it's quite likely that the uh, material here mixes with the, these outer layers. And in fact, uh, it's, it seems like Larry Nittler has already found a, 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 a potential example, some potential examples of this. These are oxide grains that he, that he and his group discovered uh, in a, a couple of years ago that have uh, very high enrichments in uh, titanium uh, 50 and chromium 54. So, uh, uh, and, and these uh, go well, you know, reasonably well with what are called slow deflagration uh, events. These, these would be thermonuclear supernovae uh, and actually uh, even the, uh, the uh, super AGB stars that, uh, uh, that Sam Jones gives even better matches to some of these, uh, these pre-solar grains. So we, we think it, it's quite likely that uh, that uh, uh, the these uh, these gnarlies uh, have this kind of thing where the uh, the uh, you have the high high neutron high density neutron rich matter mixes with the oxygen. So uh, many years ago, we worked with uh, Larry Grossman and Alex Fedkin and did a few calculations where we took some neutron rich uh, iron group nuclei and mixed them with uh, mixed them with oxygen and. Um, and saw that uh, uh, if we did the equilibrium calculations, we could in fact uh, get uh, 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 perovskite to condense in a, in in this rel uh, in this in an, in an appropriate mix of these kinds of materials. So uh, it seems quite likely that this this could happen. Um, so that the next step, I'm just going to mention here some modeling that I've been doing recently, where I've been putting uh, putting dust grains of various types into a, a chemical evolution model of the galaxy, and uh, I should say that uh, what we're we're looking at is a is a is just kind of a a, a small region of the galaxy. Here's a mass in uh, solar masses. This is a very small region. It's maybe a million solar masses out of the galaxy, but but uh, I'm injecting uh, dust grains in from various types of uh, stellar events, uh, basically normal uh, core collapse supernovae, normal thermonuclear supernovae, mass from say AGB stars, low mass stars, and then what I call low entropy dust. This, is, this would be the gnarly dust. This would be the stuff coming out of these uh, rare, rare events that uh, eject the neutron rich uh, low entropy matter. Uh, because they're rare events, you can see that their mass is fluctuating a lot because the dust grains are being destroyed, uh, but then they are, um, of course, being replenished by by new events, but you can see that uh, they're they're uh, they're a relatively uh, small fraction of all the dust that's uh, that's in the, uh, the galaxy uh, at this point. The old dust is basically the um, uh, is is the dust that's been reprocessed. This this dust that goes out into the interstellar medium, it uh, it's sputtered away and then reaccretes, and it has a more normal isotopic composition. So we would expect some. 
a population of something like uh, you know one part in ten to the five or so of the mass of, uh, of dust in the in the galaxy might be uh, might be this uh, gnarly type dust. Okay, so anyway, that was uh, uh, a review kind of of the nucleosynthesis and maybe a little bit about the uh, about the uh, 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 the kind of evolution that we might expect in the, uh, in the interstellar medium, those would be the building blocks that then would go into the uh, protoplanetary disk and um, uh, uh, potentially be the sources of these uh, correlated anomalies in this uh, uh, meteoritic uh, material. So I'm gonna finish just by presenting uh, this uh, uh, sequence of chemistries, uh, the way we like to, are starting to like to think about uh, cosmic chemical memory. If, uh, if we see isotopes in uh, meteoritic samples uh, that, uh, uh, that reflect or cat retain some memory of where they were made in an astrophysical environment, then they've gone through a, a rather uh, extraordinary sequence of chemistries. The stage one would be, of course, the nucleosynthesis itself, in the explosion, it, it would be on the matter of time scales if we're thinking about this, uh, about these exploding white dwarf stars. That matters then uh, uh, expands out and uh, we would have the, the uh, chemistry that would create the carriers. This would be the coupling during the mass eject ejection, which would be occurring on the time scales of days to weeks, presumably, or even months in, in these events. Then we would have our stage three, which would be the coupling and, and decoupling in the interstellar medium as, as dust grains uh, get sputtered away. Uh, they, they, uh, they would lose their memory from, the, from being produced together in the gnarly. And then uh, in uh, stage four, of course, then, we, then these go into the protoplanetary disk and go through all the processing that would occur mm -hmm. in, that, in that disk. And, uh, 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 give rise to the isotopic anomalies that we would see. And finally, in stage five, uh, five there would be presumably on the time scales of the age of the, age of the uh, uh, solar system itself, potentially uh, coupling or decoupling by a, a parent body processing, but that's, uh, that's, another, that's another story. So hopefully uh, this, is, this is maybe the takeaway point is that maybe we're, uh, this is a, a picture that you can carry around and. Uh, 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 and the, the, grand, the grand picture of these isotope anomalies. And I, I think I'll end there, thanks. Thank you much, Bradley. Um, while you're writing your questions, everyone, um, I'll start off with probably a naive question or two. Sure. Um, I'm curious about, I think you might have answered this in the, in the slide where you were showing Larry's work, um, but I'm wondering if the abundance ratios of the neutron rich, light iron group elements like calcium 48, titanium 50, et cetera. If what you predict in the model in that low entropy core in terms of abundance ratios produces the slopes that we see in the solar system. Uh, I think that's probably not the case. Uh, I think it's probably gonna to have to be some filtering through the, the carrier itself. Right, so it's a more complicated thing than just yeah, relating right. directly to Right, I, I, I think in a way you're, you're wanting to jump, if I may, from right here all the way to right here. <laughs> yes, exactly. And, um, and um, I, I think it'd be, uh, there's, there's really nothing that's going to tell you that it's a, say a one-to-one -one ratio. Right. Uh, uh, because it's, it's, you're going to have pockets with different YEs, it's going to be very, that, and each, I, I should say it's, it's rather extraordinary if you, if you really look at, uh, maybe if I can go back to this, this curve right here, it's really quite extraordinary if you think about it. Parts, parts of this, say, say this zone right here in the, in the, in the, in the star would be you know, almost 50% chromium 54 and, uh, and whatever this is, 50% uh, mm -hmm. iron 58. I mean, it's just, Right. That's kind of mind boggling, right? If, if every other atom that was around you was, uh, was uh, chromium 54. Yeah. So, but to get these one-to-one -one ratio, to get a one-to-one -one ratio just here, and then how would that actually survive? You know, yeah, unless really, you directly injected it into the solar system miraculously. Yeah, exactly. It was actually this plot that inspired my question. Yes. Um, yes. So, so that's perfect. Yeah, no, uh, I think it has, I think it has to be the, what we call the stage two chemistry that, uh, right. that, that couples them. 
Um, I don't see any other questions coming up, but I have, I have one, which is more general and it's just started. It, it kind of bugged me from the beginning of your talk. Yeah. And I, I didn't really understand what you meant by low entropy dust. Cause I have a certain right. view in mind about what entropy means. And I, and I need a little bit more explanation of that. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. So, um, it's, it's a, it's really kind of an interesting point. So I, I don't know how, how technical to get, but, but um, when we have a high entropy, what tends to happen is, um, is that in nucleosynthesis, you, you, you are inefficient in creating heavy nuclei. And so what happens is you, you create a few, heavy, a few heavy nuclei and then you have a whole lot of free nucleons left over. And so those free nucleons tend to glom on to the handful of, uh, the handful of heavy nuclei that you've made. Mm -hmm. And so you make, uh, you, you make these giant, giant, uh, giant nuclei. So uh, that's why you tend to, I mean, that's exaggeration, but that's why you tend to, tend to favor heavier Neutron rich species in uh, in a in a in a high uh, high entropy environment. Right. Whereas it, when, in low entropy, what it's it's fairly easy to make the uh, say the seeds for for nuclei, and so you make a lot of them. But because you make a lot of them, uh, you tend to uh, uh, you, you they have to be lighter. And uh, ultimately, the reason for that is is the way you make heavy nuclei is you go through a, a three three body reactions. And the three body reactions are going to, uh, are just going to be um, less efficient at, uh, at the higher entropy uh, making, therefore making fewer heavy, uh, heavy nuclei, which then, and uh, th then become the seeds. And so uh, that's, that's kind of the picture, but uh, no, that's, that's I'm sure helpful. there's, I'm sure there's a good uh, uh, a ge uh, geochemistry example that I can't think of at the moment. But. <laughs> that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, any more questions from the attendees? If not, thanks so much again, Bradley. And yeah, I'd, like, I'd like to thank all of the presenters and attendees. Um, I thought it was a great format for a meeting. We should definitely do this again. Um, it probably doesn't take a pandemic to get together like this. So <laughs> we, we can, uh, you know, save some CO2 emissions from flights all over the world and, and try some more of these um, webinars. Um, with that, again, I'll just thank everybody and I'll sign off. And if you have any feedback, um, please do let me know. So thank you and cheers. <laughs>